Hey, hey, hey. Time for another Out of This World episode from Our Space. Have you ever been sitting there in disbelief, wishing you could wake up from whatever nightmare you find yourself in? But no matter what you do, the nightmare becomes relentless and you're unable to run away from whatever it is that is terrorizing you? Today's story walks us through the seven levels of a hellish nightmare. We're all at the mercy of this cheating heart. For those who are already familiar with this story, use the timestamps to navigate to the most recent updates. My life is a wreck. There isn't a soul in the world I can talk about this with. I don't know if I need advice, a pep talk, or what. I use my main account for memes and other BS, but I made this throwaway because I'm going mad trying to cope. Life has pushed me to the edge and I'm struggling to find my integrity. Yet, I question what actually are the righteous things to do, say, and think. I guess to begin, I need to explain that I'm typing this in a hospital room. Yesterday, about 7.30 a.m., my wife and I were involved in a wreck. I came out with only a few cuts and bruises. Mary, my wife, suffered a crushed shoulder, broken collarbone, three broken ribs, and a collapsed lung. They expect her to fully recover, but for now, they have her heavily sedated. Having to type this out on a phone is a daunting task, but at the moment, I have the time to push through, even if I'm not sure I have the will to do it. I wouldn't be posting in this sub if things were perfect with our marriage, obviously. I just could never imagine my wife being unfaithful in any way. My heart is broken. I feel incomplete, like part of me is missing. And saddest of all, that part is sitting a mere three feet away from me. I had felt this growing apart over the last three months, but I couldn't come up with a reason why. We are both 34. Marie and I have known each other since we were children. We began dating in high school and all the way through college. She is the only woman I have ever done anything of a physical nature with. Up until recently, she could say the same. We married a year after college and had our first child, Michael, a year later. Three years after my son was born, Carrie, our daughter, began a life of me trying to spoil her rotten. I love my kids more than life itself. If not for them, I'm not sure I would be here right now. They were not involved in the wreck, thank God. They were spending the night at my parents. We were due to fly down to Florida for a cruise yesterday afternoon. Obviously, that is all canceled. But my wife decided to go out with her best friend, even though I urged her to get home and not drive around in the snow. She swore she and her best friend, Rebecca, were just going to have a few drinks since they wouldn't see each other for a week. I went to bed and slept like a baby until about 5 a.m. I got up and looked out the window to see my wife's car was not out front, but we'd gotten several more inches of snow. I assumed Marie and Becca got a little too drunk and crashed at her place. I threw some clothes on and got into my SUV. Before I left, I texted Marie to tell her not to drive, that the snow was too deep and I was coming to get her. It remained on unread. I cannot guess how many times I have wondered what would have happened if she'd read that text. I'd still be living a lie. I'd still have a gut feeling, but I wouldn't be in the utter misery I now find myself. I got to Becca's and pulled up in front of her condo. I looked at the message again and it still had not been read. I had actually hoped Marie would read it and be ready when I arrived. But I resigned myself to the fact that I'd have to go in and wake her. The front door was unlocked, so I walked in and looked at the TV room to my right. There was nobody passed out on the sofa. Rebecca's bedroom was downstairs, and I didn't want to wake her. So, I took the stairs up to her guest room and opened the door. Then my life ended. I remember walking into the room and seeing two heads peeking out from the covers. I remember leaning down to pull the comforter toward me. I even remember seeing my wife laying her head on some guy's shirtless chest. The next thing I remember was Becca, Marie, and some half-naked guy I'd never seen trying to pull me off of him. I'd probably be in jail right now if they hadn't, but I honestly don't remember a damn thing. So right or wrong, I don't really feel too bad about that. My wife on the other hand, well, that changes from minute to minute these days. When I came to my senses, the dude said he'd get his buddy to the hospital. Marie bawled her eyes out while Rebecca and I screamed it out. I told her and my wife I was leaving, and she had about five minutes to be in my car or to not bother coming home. She was there in three really not a good idea to be angry driving in snow, even with four-wheel drive, but it was another vehicle that veered into our lane and forced us through a guardrail. That's what caused Marie's injuries. The car rolled, thank God for airbags, but we lived. The kids don't even know we had a wreck. I haven't called anyone, I probably should have, but this wasn't just a wreck, 
My life has been wrecked and I'm trying to gauge the damage before I start bringing others into the situation. I'm numb and yet I hurt like hell and not from the wreck. I feel like I don't even know the person laying in that hospital bed. I want to ask her so many damn questions, but I really don't want to know any of the answers. She obviously no longer loves me. No one with a soul could cheat on someone they love. So I have to ask if she ever loved me. And now that she has cheated, would I ever want her to love me again if that were possible? I don't know the specifics of when she first cheated, but in my book, the instant she did, our marriage ended. The vows were broken. She ended our marriage, and we are no longer man and wife. I don't need a divorce attorney to nullify my marriage. She's already done that. Therefore, I am no longer under obligation to the vows I gave. A huge part of me wants to just walk out of this room. I want to call their parents, tell them what she did and what happened, and then let them know she is their problem again after all these years. We said for better or for worse, and I meant it, but we are no longer married. Part of me wants to leave her a note and tell her too bad worse happened to come after she ended our relationship. The only thing that is keeping me in this damn room is my children. I want to see them so badly right now, but I have some scratches on my face and neck. They'd know something happened if they saw me. As much as I feel my wife has defiled herself and her family, my kids need her. I thought I had a life partner, and as horrible as she ended up being, my children need a mom in their life. There are going to be talks I am not qualified to have and wouldn't know where to begin. There are going to be injuries that need kisses instead of being told to walk it off. I'm a damn good father, but I can't be a mother too. Please, someone help me. How can I sit here and look over someone who has stabbed me in the back so cruelly? Should I call her parents to come? What do I tell them? I really don't want to be here, especially with her parents. If I don't tell them what she did, they're going to know I'm pissed off. What in God's name do I tell my children? Yeah, I can tell them we were in a wreck, but I'm not the kind that can fake emotion. Obviously, my wife does it with ease, but when I loathe someone, it shows in my face. They will know I'm angry at their mother. How the hell did my life come to this? I already know I need to see a lawyer. I figured that much out, but how do I handle this? It took so long to get approved that I didn't think my post had posted. I just started getting notifications, so I am sorry for not responding sooner to people that made comments trying to help. Update. For whatever reason, I could not respond to questions from my first post. It may have something due to this being a throwaway account, but I could reply to comments, but nobody could see the replies but me. I tried posting this update in the infidelity sub last night, but had issues. Hopefully, the same glitch doesn't happen with this update. I can give feedback for others to better assist me. My apologies to anyone that did leave a response. It was appreciated and helpful. After my initial post that day, I decided to stay one more night in that hospital room. But the Marie sedated and the lights out. I laid back in the recliner looking at the ceiling, listening to the medical machines. I laid there wondering how the hell my life had reached that point. Part of me felt like I was giving her undeserved mercy just being in the same room, yet part of me loved her. I didn't want to feel that love. I actually felt weak for having any positive feelings towards her. Over and over in my mind, I kept realizing that there was no fixing things back to the way they were. It was as if some natural disaster had taken the life we built and destroyed it. I cried. I cried so damn hard. I realized a huge part of my life was over. There was a moment of huge significance in my life. When the nurse came into the room to take blood the next morning, I excused myself. When Marie woke, she saw me heading out the door and called to me, but I acted like I didn't hear her. I went and got some breakfast. I haven't had much of an appetite since finding out. I tried to kill some time eating and scanning through my phone. There was a text from Becca asking where Marie was that I left her unread. I decided at 7 a.m. it was late enough to knock on her parents' door. Her dad was always an early riser. I planned to talk to him first and if he thought his wife needed to hear it, he could wake her. I saw smoke coming from the wood stove in his workshop out back, so I knocked on the door before entering. He saw the scratches on my neck and bruise on my cheek. I explained there had been an accident. Marie had gotten the worst of it, but we needed to talk. I think he assumed I meant about the accident, so he woke my mother-in-law to hear what I had to say. We sat in the kitchen as I explained how going around a curve, a car in the oncoming lane veered into our lane. Having the heavier vehicle and all-wheel drive, I managed to keep us on the road until we hit the guardrail. The passenger side door caught one of the vertical I-beams mounted on concrete. Even with side airbags, Marie hit hard. She sustained lots of injuries, but I told them she was stable, and they expected a full recovery. They both cried knowing their daughter had suffered, 
but would still be around for them to love. As soon as they insinuated, they would be around to help me in any way they needed to assist me looking after Marie. That was when I stopped them and explained the wreck wasn't what I had come to tell them. They looked confused as I explained waking up that morning and sending a text to head off in the snow to make sure my wife was okay. I told them about walking in on her daughter and some guy I'd never seen and unconsciously beating him over and over. They were both shocked. Then I told them what room she was in at the hospital, explained I always wanted them to be part of the kids' lives, so I hoped they could remain friendly with me. I told them my dad was looking after them at the moment, but I was divorcing their daughter as she had broken our vows and was no longer my wife. I was leaving their place and driving to my dad's to tell the kids about the wreck. I was also going to tell them we were splitting up and wouldn't be together anymore. I wasn't going to tell them their mother was a cheater. I told my former in-laws that while I hated things had to end the way they did, at least I could say I wasn't the one who destroyed our marriage and my life. They tried to tell me I shouldn't be so hasty. She made a mistake and the usual lame excuses. I just smiled and told them I'd loved having them as in-laws over the years and walked out. When I got to my dad's, I of course had so much I needed to get off my chest. I entered through the kitchen where I found my dad having a cup of coffee. The only thing he knew was that I was supposed to be on a big boat in the Caribbean. He stood and asked what I was doing there. I just grabbed him, hugged him, and cried like a child. It was the kind of thing where he really wanted to know what was going on, but sensed he needed to let me cry it out before prying. He led me to the den and sat me on the couch to go get my mom. We both urged her to have a cup of coffee first, but she knew if I was there alone that early, I had something bad to tell them. I first explained about Marie cheating, me catching her, and leaving Becca's. Then I explained about the wreck, that it was pretty bad. I told them about Marie's injuries, and explained I'd let her parents know only an hour before, so they could go see her. Both of my parents were stunned. My mom finally asked me now what I'm going to do. They both cried when I told them my only remaining option was to divorce Marie and be the best father I could for my children. As our conversation was winding down, I heard my daughter Carrie squeal, Daddy! and come running down the stairs toward me. That woke up my son, who was also downstairs with a few minutes. I hadn't seen them in so long, I just spent time hugging them, happy to see them. They took a while to notice my scratches. I told them about the wreck and that their mommy was in the hospital, but going to be fine. I told them Marie's parents would eventually pick them up to take them to see their mom and left it at that. I spent a day playing, talking to, holding, napping with, and laughing with my children, and those two made me want to live again. Until that point, if I'm honest, I was like 50-50 about wanting to go on, but they are worth living for, protecting, and cherishing. My wife's phone was destroyed in the wreck, so nobody had gotten a response for days. Early that night, I started getting texts from my mother-in-law's phone and knew they had to be from Marie. I ignored them. They continued sporadically off and on through the night, turned off notifications. The next day, I spoke with three law offices about filing for divorce. I can't say I want or even need a legal divorce, but that will divide assets and determine custody of our children. What she does with who is no longer of any concern of mine. I met with two and I liked the latter one quite a bit. I'll meet with the third rated lawyer to see if he wows me. If not, I'm going with the second firm's top divorce attorney. Either way, I will have removed three top legal sources from her list of candidates, and that's a win in my book. Custody is my primary focus. I'm not going for full custody, and I wouldn't want it if I could get it. They need their mother in their lives. But because she did what she did, she can never again be a part of my life. A go-between can drop the kids off on time whenever they need to be where they need to be. Not a reason in this world for me to ever say another word to her. I obviously never knew her, so why would I continue to interact with a stranger? I go back to work next week from what would have been our cruise. I didn't tell a soul at work we didn't go or anything about the wreck. And of course, they will be seeing me driving the rental car and question if I got a new car. I'm not sure if I need to explain things to HR, but I don't want my personal business to be aired out for all to see. I feel humiliated as it is without news leaking out. Divorce is a necessity sometimes, but it always represents a failure. But I'm done being an anchor for a ship that has already sunk. And for those who insisted rightly to get checked for STDs, I've had a full screening. It came back clean on everything. Thank God. Even that was enough to make me feel like some trench coat pervert when I did nothing wrong. I assume by this time, Marie has left the hospital. Her parents did not even attempt to bring her to the house. They couldn't have contacted me anyway due to Marie's constant texts I wasn't reading. 
As soon as I can get the divorce papers filed and her served, I can be done with the biggest mistake of my life. Her actions invalidated all of that time. If I had to do it over again, I would now not do it again. I would choose a life with someone else, anyone else who would actually be faithful and loyal. Her greatest asset is what she intentionally threw away, the ability to be trusted. From having someone to call your own to being alone, that's what I'll miss. But I know all of that was a lie and I meant nothing to her. People will swoon over a beautiful lie and repel an ugly truth. I'm not one of those people. A lot of people wanted the dirty details of who my wife strayed with, why and how long it had been going on. I'm sorry, I don't have that information to share, but I really don't want to know. Outside of a person literally putting a gun to your head, there's no excuse to cheat. Beyond that, when you have made a life bond you have sworn to uphold and make the decisions for the other person to ruin it, you are vile. I wish to God I'd never met her and had taken a chance on someone, anyone else. She had no right to give me a life and then take it all from me against my will. The man I was before her betrayal will never exist again. The woman she was never existed and the life I had is a facade in ruins nobody wants to live in. Let's pause here and get some reactions from the community. Cranach has something to say. First of all, take a breather. Yes, you should call her parents and ask them to take care of her because you are mentally and physically in no condition to help her, even if you would want to. Also, tell them what she did. Don't start to lie for your wife. She has lied enough and these lies need to end right now. You need someone to talk to and to let your emotions out. So look for a good friend or family member that you can trust and talk to them. Don't make any life-altering decisions right now while your emotions are so raw. What you need now is distance to your wife and time to process and understand what she did there. This was not a one-time thing or something that happened out of a moment. This was long planned and probably her long-term affair partner, maybe not even her first affair partner. If she has stayed before at Becca's place, then you better expect to know why she stayed there. Please stay away from alcohol and drugs. They won't help you. Your marriage is over and the woman you thought she was never existed in the first place. That was only the idea you had of her. Now you know who she is and what she is capable of, and sooner or later, you need to ask yourself the question, if you would ask this woman to be your wife as well, or if that kind of woman is not a woman you would want by your side. In the end, she never wanted to come clean, never wanted to end this, and keep on to make decisions for her affairs and against you. She got supported in that by her best friend, but in the end, this all only happened because she wanted this to happen. Good luck and stay strong. And please get tested for STDs. Better safe than sorry. The OP replies, I got a complete STD panel done and everything came back clean. Thank God. Knowing a few people in the medical field is convenient sometimes. I haven't spoken a word to Marie, even sitting alone with her in that room. She would try to speak to me. Her speech was garbled and slurred. I just looked at her with an expression of disgust and waited on her to pass out again. I don't have any info about exactly who the guy was, how many times it happened, and for how long. Marie's phone was destroyed in the wreck. I think she has access to her mom's phone now because I started getting multiple texts. She can let Becca know why she hadn't responded and plan her next trysts for all I care. I haven't been drinking, so you don't have to worry about me getting drunk and doing something stupid. I have to say though, after this week, I can see why people do drugs and drink to excess. I wish I could put life on pause and forget about it for 24 hours, but my problems would still be there the next day. First of all, I'm so thankful that the two of you made it out of such a horrific wreck alive. Secondly, even though your emotions might try to sway you towards having an aggressive screaming confrontation with your partner, OP, that's not always the best way to resolve your and approach the issue. You're a mature adult, and although the situation isn't ideal, you should take time to slow your roll because you and your relationship with your family will be better off for it. It might seem trivial, but making a for and against list can help you face reality head on. Gather all the facts. Sometimes we need to know all of the facts and see the big picture. Is the relationship worth pursuing? Can you move forward after a cheating incident? These are all important questions to ask yourself and a pros and cons list can definitely help put that reality into perspective. We may be seeing validation where there isn't any because we become so consumed. We can start to twist our reality. Drawing a list helps you externalize, get it out of your head, and see it from a different perspective. This may be enough to soothe you or encourage you to take a different direction. Update 1 
Not only am I not sure where to begin, I'm not even sure what to say when I do. I guess the first thing is to tell everyone I did manage to get a very good lawyer. Her firm in general is rated the highest at representing men in divorce cases in my area. Instead of passing my case off to someone else on the legal team, she took on my case as her own. Everyone at the firm has been kind and supportive. I can tell they don't just care about getting their retainer and payoff. Nadia, my lawyer, has done everything she can to help me with my well-being and sanity. After agreeing to take my case, we went over the usual forms I need to fill out. I listed property and all bank account info, as well as ballpark estimates of what Marie and I make income-wise. After explaining about the wreck and what I saw just before it happened, she asked if I had an STD panel. I explained that I had and everything had come back clean. She then asked if I had documented the infidelity with pictures or video. I told her I hadn't been thinking rashly enough at the moment to do that. She phoned a PI her firm uses and set up a meeting between he and I the next day. I live in an at-fault state. So, while I knew Marie was unfaithful, I needed actual evidence for the divorce to go my way. We set up one of her staff to be the go-between for me and Marie's dad as far as communication goes and to arrange drop-offs. I got her aide to go ahead and notify my soon-to-be ex-father-in-law that my ex could have the kid that upcoming weekend and following week. Nadia then asked if I had arranged therapy for me and my children. I explained that I was due to have my first therapy appointment that week, but as the children had yet to be told anything, I was holding off on that. She told me as soon as I felt they were in need of any professional attention to let her know. She had several therapists she could recommend. She expressed what seemed to be sincere condolences I was having to go through all I have and will. I tend to dislike lawyers, but I do think I might have found one with an actual soul. She gave me a list of things to collect and do before our next meeting. Many of the instructions were identical to the advice users post here. So, when she told me to drop by the drugstore to get two DNA kits, I thought nothing of it. I knew it was standard protocol. When I got home with the kids that night, I did the cheek swabs for me and them. I sealed everything up and mailed the kits off after taking the kids to school the next morning. Two days later was Friday, and the go-between dropped the kids off with their grandfather for the weekend that morning. I went to work and I was just coming back from lunch when I got an email notification from my personal account. I could see it was two emails from the lab, so I waited to get to my computer to view them. At my desk, I opened the first email and clicked the link. The results said my son Michael is in fact my son. I opened the other email and clicked the link. I read what it said. I read what it said again. I couldn't really say anything. I just started shaking my head. I knew I had to get out of the office before breaking down but I managed to do screenshots of both results and email them to myself as photo files. I went to my car and began bawling as the realization my daughter, Carrie, was in fact not my daughter set in. I can't imagine having an arm cut off would hurt much more than losing a daughter. It honestly felt like my soul had been taken from me. I don't know any other way to describe it. I don't know who to call. I just sat there crying and wishing like hell I could wake up from my nightmare. I downloaded the two files from my email account and texted the pics to my lawyer. Within 20 seconds, Nadia called asking where I was. Work was all I could manage to say. She told me to stay there and someone from the firm would be there in a few minutes. I ended the call and opened the door. I began to vomit uncontrollably until I was dry heaving. By the time I managed to stop puking and feeling dizzy, one of the paralegals arrived to pick me up. She took me to the firm and as soon as Nadia finished with the client, they ushered me into her office. The first thing she told me was that sometimes the tests come back wrong. She said she understood I was upset and had every right to be, but she urged me we needed to test Carrie and me again in a local lab to ensure nothing gets contaminated. I couldn't believe what was happening. Even after catching Marie cheating, I just assumed the DNA test on the kids was a formality. I would never have thought my wife would ever be unfaithful, but imagine she was capable of having some other man's baby, if true, who in the hell did I marry? I couldn't even confront Marie if I wanted to. I didn't have concrete proof. Yet I couldn't imagine if the results confirmed what we highly suspected, how she and I would ever have that conversation. One of the ladies in the office at the firm had a blood pressure cup and checked mine to make sure it wasn't at dangerous levels. It was elevated and I did feel like I was close to a panic attack. Yet I was numb and in shock at the same time. I wondered what was next. I struggled to grasp my little girl might have never been my little girl. At that moment, I was so glad the kids were staying with their mom. I started wondering if both tests results could be wrong and Carrie was my daughter and Michael wasn't my son. I knew I couldn't wait two days to know the truth. So, 
the go-between set up a time she could pick Carrie up the next day for a few hours and take her back to Marie's parents. We did the test in a sterile environment and by trained medical staff. There was no mix-up. I am not Carrie's father. It still took a day to get results and she was back with her mom by the time I got them. But I cried even harder the second time and I'm so glad Carrie wasn't there to witness it. I sent the results to my lawyer and she called to check on me. She urged me to seek out family and not go through the things alone. I got into my car and drove to my dad's crying the whole way. When I got there and saw my mom, she knew something was wrong, but couldn't get it out of me. Finally, I just managed to utter, Carrie is not my daughter. Mom asked me, what? But she knew she heard correctly and I was incapable of repeating it. After about 30 seconds of silence, other than me weeping uncontrollably, she stood and got her cell phone. She called my dad. She told him to hurry home, but please be very careful that I had bad news. I could tell my dad wanted at least a hint of what could be so bad. She just urged him to be safe and get home as soon as he could. He arrived in about 20 minutes and we all just had a long cry for hours. I'd console my dad, he'd console my mom, they'd console me, but we were all inconsolable. They of course asked me about Michael and I assured them he was mine. They both expressed relief and then felt badly for being relieved to only be losing one grandchild. They asked me what I was going to do. I told them I didn't know. The only thing that was certain for me at that moment was that Carrie would never want for anything she'd needed and most things she wanted. I didn't even care about potential required child support at that moment. She was going to be taken care of. As horrible as I was feeling for myself, I felt even worse for Carrie, being totally innocent. Did I want custody of her? Could I get custody of Carrie even if I wanted it? I began to wonder if Marie knew or suspected. I suddenly wanted some damn answers. I met with Nadia after work Monday, and she told me she'd met with the private detective hired to follow Marie. Due to the wreck, she hadn't been out of the house to cheat anymore. So I wasn't surprised he didn't have recent evidence. But one of the things Nadia had me bring was Marie's old cell phone from out of a drawer at home. He was able to get in and access nearly every app as if he were on her destroyed phone. He found nudes sent and received to and from various guys. Tons of messages and sexting with enough admission of guilt in them to sway any judge. I was asked if I wanted to see any of the pictures or read the texts. I declined. But Nadia and I did need a plan how I was going to confront Marie about Carrie. She thought it best to do it in her office if Marie could be talked into it. She called Marie's mom's cell in front of me. I heard Marie's voice for the first time since I left the hospital. Nadia got straight to the point and told her she needed to meet with me to explain a few things. My ex declared she'd been waiting and wanting to talk. She was asked if her lawyer could be contacted. Marie said she didn't have one, but said she was willing to come the next afternoon to talk. It was all I could do to get through that next day without crying like a lunatic at work and yet pretend to be getting things done. I was barely able to keep lunch down, but I left at three and headed to the firm feeling nauseous. I arrived first intentionally. I wanted her to be forced to enter, sit on the side away from the door and unable to try and approach me. I was scrolling through pictures of our perfect family that never existed when she came in. She needed assistance walking and was still in two casts from the wreck. I didn't have to worry about her trying for a hug. I thought she might be playing it up for sympathy, but we did have a bad wreck. I finally wanted her just to sit the hell down so I could ask her to explain herself. Once we were all seated, water was offered, and the meeting began. My lawyer started by asking Marie if she minded us recording the meeting. She was fine with it. As soon as we started recording, my soon-to-be ex-wife began to try and apologize. I bluntly interrupted her and asked her point blank how many men had she cheated on me with and when did it start. There were enough confirmed hookups from the PI to know the guy I caught her with wasn't the first by a mile. She didn't know what we knew of course, and I guess to reduce the severity of the incident before the wreck her plan was to only admit to what she knew we knew. I asked her again, rough estimate, how many men she had slept with since our son was born. Giving that specific time frame seemed to give her a minute's pause, but she kept trying to act clueless. She still thought it was all a game at that point, and I was losing my cool. Nadia put her hand on my shoulder and gently pushed me back away from the table. She looked at Marie and asked if I was a good father. She quickly gave me a glowing review, saying she couldn't ask for a better father to raise her children. I wanted to stand and flip the table at the way she stated her children. Nadia then asked her if the other father of her child was going to be a good dad too. 
As Marie was asking what other father she was talking about, my counsel slid the paternity results for Carrie across the table. As much as I have hated what my life has become since discovering her cheating, I needed to be there to see her reaction in person. She was obviously shocked to know Carrie isn't mine, and she tried to hit me with the whole, you're her father who has raised her, and I had to shut that down. I asked her who Carrie's father is. She looked down with a hint of shame, and I thought she might be protecting someone. When she said she didn't know for sure who Carrie's father is, Marie saw me truly break down in tears for the first time. I just couldn't take it anymore and lost it. Marie was crying, but asked to try and explain. She reminded me about the postpartum depression she went through after Michael was born. I did my best to be as sympathetic as I could at the time. I can say with certainty I spent every moment I could looking after my son so she could have time to herself. There were days she was so depressed she couldn't even get out of bed, and I looked after all of us. But I loved doing it. I loved doing it for the family I had. I remembered. I had actually been foolish enough to be thinking making it through had made our relationship stronger. And nope. She didn't blame it on Rebecca, but when she first got Marie to go on a few girls' nights out, I was relieved if not grateful. They'd been best friends for years, but hadn't seen much of each other during the first pregnancy. Marie said she got really drunk the second time they went out, and she let some guy feel her up while she gave him head. She said she felt guilty about it for a while, for months, but she began to resent not getting to be young and free to be with whomever she chose. She told us she started hooking up with the guys that nights she would go out with Rebecca. Until the night before our wreck, she'd never not come home or come home late over the years. She claimed she didn't want to develop feelings for any of the guys. She claimed she always used protection and never slept with the same guy more than three times. She said she just wanted sex. I was dumbfounded. Finding out your wife is a filthy lying slut tends to do that. It was like learning your life as a reality show you didn't ask to be in. I wanted to yell at her, but I was too busy calculating how many men she possibly cheated on me with over a period of years. Nadia asked if she had any idea who Carrie's father might be, and she swore she always assumed she was mine. My lawyer pointed out that obviously something happened and suggested maybe a condom broke. When my wife confessed that it happened a few times with a few guys, I lost my shit. I asked her who in the hell she was, because I didn't know the person telling me such horrible things. Like she was telling me to pass the salt. I asked her when she started hating me and why. I asked her what I had ever done to warrant being treated like she did. How could she do this to her daughter? I raged. She took it, knowing it was all true. After what she'd just told me and what I expressed about how I feel about her, divorce is a given. What was a marriage had become scorched earth. The only thing left to do was total up the casualties. I've lost a wife and a daughter, that's two. A wife lost a husband, that's three. A daughter lost a father, and a brother had his sister become a half. Then you get into grandparents and in-laws. Marie essentially destroyed two entire families. Her parents will not be okay with what she was doing, and I swear by all that's holy, I will let them see all the evidence the PI finds. She admitted to meeting with men from dating apps with Rebecca and using girl time as a time to hook up. She claimed she never meant to hurt me. She swore she had no idea Carrie isn't mine. I actually believe her because I had no idea either, but DNA doesn't lie. I asked why she didn't just divorce me. She came straight out and said because she didn't want to lose the security I gave her. She cried. All of it was said through tears, but I know my expression was of just scorn. I was disgusted at the person who sat across from me. I felt used, humiliated, emasculated. I feel defeated. I'm pretty sure one of the reasons she came to talk without a lawyer is due to the fact I own everything. She doesn't have much to lose outside of a small 401k and my assets I entered the marriage with by inheriting my grandfather's estate when I was 14. The woman I call mom is not my biological mother. My mother died when I was two from a rare, fast-spreading cancer. My dad remarried the woman I call mom when I was four. I have known my entire life she wasn't my biological mother, and I wasn't her biological son. I learned later she couldn't have children and raising me helped her experience that. When my biological mother's dad died, what was left to her went to me as her heir but I couldn't touch it until I was 21. I studied hard and went to school, but I didn't have to work. Fiscally, she knows I will mop the floor with her in the divorce, and she won't be getting anything close to half. She has a job. She isn't able to work at the moment with her injuries, but she has a job. Part of me wants to punish her, and the other part of me wants to be done with her. Marie was obviously medicated for pain. Maybe that's why she was being so blunt. 
but her words just cut me deep as my imagination made them even worse. I asked if she felt any shame. She claimed she did. I asked how the hell we were going to find out who Carrie's father actually is. My soon-to-be ex-wife started in with the, I already know who the father is. B.S. I was not in the mood for some philosophical discussion about what constitutes being a father. Whomever Carrie's father actually is deserves to know, and she needs to know about his family for health reasons. The evidence the PI had found didn't stretch back to before Carrie was born. I asked her if she could find any of those men or had saved their numbers. She had the audacity to say the point of losing their number was to never see them again. My God, how did I not see that logic? I told her she might have wanted to keep his number to let him know he had a child on the way or she got an STD. I want my name off of Carrie's birth certificate. DNA proves she is her mother's child and not mine. As stated, I will support her financially on my own free will long past her turning 18. She will not want for anything. As for my son and custody, I'm truly not sure what to do. Before the paternity test, I was strongly going for a 90-10 arrangement giving my ex-wife custody one weekend a month and certain holidays. Now that Carrie is not mine, I don't feel right about pursuing custody for her even if I could get it. As Michael is in fact her brother, albeit half, I don't want to take him from her too. I don't want either of them to suffer, but I haven't seen Carrie since the test results and I can't let her see me break down because of them. God knows how much her therapy is going to cost me, but I will have to pay for it. There is no way to know if her real dad can afford it, and my own therapy will be enough to pay for some shrink's new beach house. Driving home after the meeting, a huge part of me just wanted to end it all. It seemed like the most beneficial solution for everyone but me. Both families could go on pretending about paternity, my ex could whore around openly while spending my grandfather's money, and the kids wouldn't have to deal with any broken marriage or failed relationships. But by the time I got home, I said, F that. Nadia is drawing up divorce papers and legal paperwork to have me declared not Carrie's father. That will make things take much longer. But I do not want any legal grounds that can force me to interact, pay for, or deal with offspring that are not mine. The legal team is doing research for ways to find out who Carrie's father is. Many of the ancestry sites suggest potential relatives when results come back. Right now, that's our first plan of action. Even if the results don't come back pointing to a certain individual, they might point to a brother, cousin, or another relative. Whomever the guy is, he may not be ready to accept a child he didn't know about. It could cause some anxiety in his life, but I doubt it will be nearly the terror I felt losing my daughter forever because she never existed. Everything is just so screwed up at the moment. Nothing is stable. Chaos is a daily burden at this point. The kids come back to the house Sunday afternoon. I've never wanted to not see them before, but I know many inevitabilities will happen I cannot be prepared for. When she sees me and wants to hug her daddy, I'm not even sure how I'll react. Hug her and cry like a baby knowing she has not ever been truly mine? Tell her I'm not the person she's looking for? I don't have it in me to be mean to her, but my heart is broken. Like there is nobody to take this out on, even Marie, because nothing I could do outside of a murder would equal the betrayal she has done to me. That scale will never be balanced. She used me and spit me out. She deserves to rot in hell for her promiscuous lying ways. I'm destroyed and everything I used to love is too. I will win the divorce. Nadia and company will make it the most lopsided division of assets in the history of divorce. But Marie reduced or removed the value of so much for me, it feels like she has already won. Again, to hell with her. I'm left with a son she will try and use against me and manipulate. Some people really are so horrible they deserve to be put down like an animal. I made the stupid decision to have a child with one. I just know now I'm not the only stupid one. TLDR Soon to be ex-wife had been hooking up with random men since the birth of our first child. Discovered the daughter we had together is not mine and soon to be ex-wife doesn't know who the father is. Parenting seems to be an interesting balance between selfishness and selflessness. In many ways, we invest in our children for selfish reasons. They carry our genes into the next generation and their success reflects back on us as parents. Yet much of what we do as parents is about selfishly putting our children's needs above our own. It seems to me that men who completely abandon a child because of DNA tests says they aren't biologically linked reveals that, for them, parenting was only ever a selfish pursuit. But that's not you, OP. I can't imagine how excruciating it was to find out about your ex, never mind Carrie. Despite the hurt and the pain, in taking the steps that you have, OP, you've taken the first steps toward ensuring that infidelity does not define the rest of your life. Infidelity is an awful event, 
but it doesn't have to be devastating. It actually has a silver lining. Infidelity, as awful as it is to experience, as awful as it is to happen, can actually be a good thing to help people change their lives. For now, as you're healing, try not to let the hurt and the pain take hold. It's easy to be angry and to stay angry, but you're not that person, OP. Update 2. Reunion Update. The go-between from the law firm texted me at 3 p.m. Sunday to let me know she had the kids securely in the car with their belongings and was on her way to the house. I doubt any text message in history has been as dreaded for anyone as that one was for me. What made it all the more tragic was the fact that weeks before, I would have smiled and anxiously awaited the text. Suddenly a reunion I would have been yearning for was something I dreaded. I had no plans to mention divorce, paternity, or any issues with the kids. As much as I tried to prepare myself, I knew I wasn't in the state of mind to bring any of that up. My goal was for things to go as normally as they could, like the other times they stayed with grandparents while Maria and I were on vacation. That's what I wanted. I knew reality was going to be something completely different, and I had little control over any of it. Jessica, the intern from the firm, pulled into the driveway. I watched them pull up from the front bay window. I walked outside and down the steps as the car pulled to a stop. I was smiling as I approached the passenger side of Jessica's car. As soon as I saw Carrie in her car seat beaming a huge smile at me, I started crying. Oh, I was still smiling. You couldn't have knocked that dang smile off of me with a 2 by 4 I just hoped, if I maintained a smile, it might convince the kids and myself everything was okay. Wish I'd had a plan B. As soon as I could get her out of the car seat, Michael was by my side and I grabbed he and Carrie and just hugged them. I told them I missed them. That was really all I could manage to say. I just kept crying. And people can hate me all they want to. God knows I've gotten some hate-filled messages privately and publicly, but it all felt different. It did not feel the same as the day I hugged my children goodbye. I want to say it did, just to get the people who think I'm a loathsome wretch off of my back. Maybe part of the loss I was feeling was over the family unit we all used to know being destroyed. My heart was just flat out broken. Seeing them and knowing she isn't mine just broke my heart all over again. That is what my life has become. Every single damn day it feels like there is a new heartbreak. I learn more of the extremes of Marie's cheating escapades. I discover pain I can't shield the kids from. I am reminded of the past bonds and know they were all founded on lies. I keep backing away from the volcanic epicenter of chaos that started when I caught Marie cheating, but I keep getting blasted with stray boulders of betrayal daily, learning how much I have been deceived. Jessica was a saint helping me get them into the house. I grabbed all of their belongings like a pack mule, and she closed the doors and trunk. As soon as I placed their bags down on the floor, I turned to see Carrie looking up at me. She didn't say anything. She just looked up at me with those eyes like she knew I was the one that needed the hug. I squatted down. She walked into my arms and wrapped her little arms around me as tightly as she knew how. That child broke me. I wanted to be strong, but no kid should hear a parent cry like that. Everyone keeps insisting I do the things that damage them the least. That's great, even logical. But what if everything damages them? What if there is no way to keep the damage from happening? Allowing her to see a source of strength and security destroyed has to be damaging her. How could it not? If I abandon her, it would destroy her. Yet by staying in her life, I am damaging her as well. A six-year-old shouldn't have to console a grown damn man, especially for something that isn't her fault. My soul was seething with rage toward Marie at that moment, but the little girl she lied and told me was mine just showed me love the only way she knew how and kept hugging. The indisputable truth of the matter, the epiphany I had at that moment, she and I are both victims. As the adult, I'm supposed to be able to maintain and handle it better. She doesn't even know she's been victimized yet. It's just as if she and I were the only survivors of a plane crash. We survived, but it's going to leave scars on our souls. But as the survivors, we need to stick together. We need to be there for each other because we're going through the same damn thing. Yes, very different perspectives. But at that moment, I was feeling the loss and yet sparing her much of the pain by taking it upon myself. I have been looking at this as Marie taking my daughter from me. But it is just as true to say Marie took her father from her. The villain in this damn story is Marie. I'm done feeling like I should feel guilt for anything I feel right now. There is no paternity handbook that I'm aware of. Reddit knows how to respond when someone is being cheated on and gives top-notch advice all the way through the divorce. The proper way to react when you find out the daughter you raised was never yours? Get the hell out of here with that crap. Nobody can tell me how the hell should feel or react. 
The only analogy I can give is children switched at birth. That's a couple facing that together. They were both deceived. They both get to find out the offspring they were told was their flesh and blood was really the sperm and ovum from another couple. Unless you've endured that or the same thing I am right now, you can't grasp how it feels. After about a half an hour, I managed to get my crap together. Jessica left after getting a hug from all three of us. I handed her a small envelope with $500 inside and told her it was for gas. I knew she drives an EV and she knew it wasn't for gas. I carried Carrie around in my arms as Michael showed me some of the things he'd helped make with his grandfather. Carrie just kept her arms around my neck, making sure I knew she'd help stain some of the wood. I went into my standard, I don't believe you, game, Michael joined in. That devolved into a tickle session first for Carrie, then Michael. I cannot convey how wonderful and at the same time heartbreaking it was to hear Carrie's squeals of laughter. Seeing Michael happy and laughing was a joy for my broken soul, because I knew the future held little to none of what we were at the moment enjoying. They teamed up to wrestle me. I liked seeing them work together, even if it was against me. Father or not, by the time she's old enough to date, I'll have her able to say no with feeling. I put on some music. Ever since she was a baby, Carrie has loved music. I have danced with her from the first week she was born up until the previous month. I'm sure I look goofy. I don't care. I have fun, and she loves acting as silly as me. I got Uber Eats to bring takeout for dinner. We aren't Asian, but sure as hell eat like it. Michael can throw down some low mein for a 10 year old, and for whatever reason, Carrie loves Crab Rangoon. I didn't eat much. My appetite has taken care of any weight loss issues I had. I just enjoyed getting to have dinner with them again. They both had school today, so I got them bathed, PJ'd, and ready for bed. Michael likes to read a book as he is settling down. I gave him a hug, told him I loved him, and I'd see him in the morning. I got Carrie tucked into bed and read her a storybook while pointing out things in the artwork. I had her about ready to nod off, and I felt myself welling up with tears. I kissed Carrie on her head and told her, I love you, for the first time since finding out. Call me the biggest a-hole on the planet, I don't care, but saying it was like allowing myself to admit it. Everything in my life has been a struggle in recent days to figure out what is real and what wasn't real. My love for Carrie is real. I love her. I do feel different. Right or wrong, I do. But I love her. I went from not wanting to take anything away from her to continuing to want to give. It's a huge difference. But anyway, I was sort of waiting for Carrie to tell me she loves me. I mean, I know she does, without her saying it. No, she took the moment to tell me, Mommy loves you. I knew what she said. I made a point not to snap at her and be as sweet as I could, possibly when I asked her, Carrie, why did you tell me that? She said Mommy told her. I very sweetly asked if Mommy just said that or if Mommy told her to tell me that. It seemed my soon-to-be ex-wife had to explain why I hadn't been to visit, wouldn't be coming over, and she wouldn't be coming home with them. She actually told the kids her parents' house was her new home, which I was kind of glad. But the I love you BS, I still had to get to the bottom of. I pried some more. Then Michael came into the room. He revealed their mom had told them she wouldn't be coming home because I didn't love her anymore. What the F was I supposed to say to that? Yep, it's all on me. I just fell out of love with your mom. Blame me was not happening. I called our usual sitter. I asked if there was any way she could come over for a few hours to look after the kids. Since they were already in bed and that meant she could study while getting paid, she agreed. I got into the car and made a beeline for my in-law's house. I didn't bother calling first. When I got there, I knocked on the front door and asked to see Marie. Her mom led me to her childhood room where she was recuperating from her injuries. I turned to her mom and placed my hand on the doorknob before telling her Marie and I needed to chat. She sensed I was a little on the pissed off side, so she scurried out of the blast radius. As soon as the door was closed, I asked just who the F she thought she was trying to pin our split on the fact I could never love her again. She said it was the truth. I told her perhaps, but the reason I could never love her again is the fact she is a lying, deceitful, worthless, promiscuous, lying whore. Way to deflect blame on her little role and everything. She then said she's already tried to apologize, but I didn't want to hear it. I exploded. I asked her what effing good a dang apology was going to do. It wasn't going to undo the damage, and it wasn't going to keep the damage from happening. And in spite of all of that, I didn't believe she was truly sorry for what she'd done. 
I asked her how she could manipulate two innocent children to make me look like the bad guy if she had any guilt. I asked her at what point I became the bad guy that destroyed our marriage. Without missing a beat, she told me when I didn't give her a second chance. Not going to lie, I stopped her and asked how much pain medication she was taking and if she was drinking alcohol with it. That was the only logical way I could see her thinking a worthless lying tramp deserves a second chance, mercy, and to be treated with dignity and respect. Nope, she lost all that by her own actions. Again, I don't even know who my wife is anymore. It's like she's been possessed by the ghost of Caligula or Charlie Sheen. My beautiful virtuous wife was replaced by a soulless hookup harlot and as a miracle of God himself, my junk hasn't rotted off due to her disgusting actions. I asked if she felt justified destroying everything in her life for sex. She said it wasn't just for sex. I reminded her she claimed to want no emotional involvement. She said much of it, especially at first, was about validation. She said she liked being chased. She got pissed when I asked how she could ever consider herself chaste, but she can go get bent. Actions affect how you are perceived the rest of your days. She can deal with it. Marie and I ended up talking several hours. When she went through the depression after having Michael, she even told me I had been the best supportive husband she could have asked for. So I had to ask, why betray me so cruelly? She said despite such a happy event in our life, there was a part of her so anxiety ridden she actually wanted to die. She said she felt love in her heart for me and for Michael, but for some reason she couldn't understand she felt depressed and dead inside. She stayed out of work for an additional six months due to her issues. I got her the best shrinks and doctors money could buy. She admits as much, and she said even that started making her feel guilty, feeling she was letting me down, I was carrying us. She said she felt overwhelmed even though she knew she wasn't bearing any of the burden. She said she started to doubt if she ever could have become a mother despite always wanting to be a mom. She withdrew from friends in person and via internet text. She told me every day she loved me and apologized. I told her she had nothing to apologize for. I just wanted her to get better. Maybe she was apologizing for what she was about to do. When Rebecca came to the house unannounced that first day, I was so glad to see her. I knew Becca was ballsy enough to not be pushed away, but be kind enough to get Marie to open up. It still took months before anything that could be considered a night on the town occurred. Just getting Marie to go to Starbucks was a victory at the time. There are a ton of guys thinking I'm the biggest schlep on earth, letting my wife go to bars or clubs with a single girlfriend. 99% of the time, you would be 100% correct, and I should have put a stop to it much sooner. But at that moment in our lives, after all the sadness and isolation, getting her out and about seemed to cheer her up even after just the first time. She tried to explain she'd suddenly become a wife and mother in a period of two years. She said seeing how thirsty men were for her, even if it was for sex, boosted her ego. She claimed the first incident wouldn't have happened if she hadn't been so drunk, but it happened willingly. Once the knob was schlobbed, she knew I'd never touch her again if I knew. She knew she'd lose everything because she came into the marriage with nothing. I asked her if she ever thought I'd find out about her cheating, or how I'd react if I did. She said she knew it would destroy me. She claimed she felt horrible about it. I asked the obvious question, why continue to cheat? She claimed as soon as she sobered up after cheating, she felt guilt, shame, and regret. I didn't remember her being really sad for a week after going out the first time. Rebecca came over, and the two of them talked for hours alone. From that point for months, I had the old Marie back. She revealed she told Rebecca that day she felt unworthy of me because of what she did. She knew if I found out we were done, I would go after Michael. She claimed she decided to take it to the grave and try to be the best wife she could be in every way to make it up to me. Red flag, yeah, now. Think I'm a fool all you wish. But we had a baby to look after and I had been doing 95% of the caregiving. Overnight, I got my wife back. At the time, I would have been stark raving mad to think that was a red flag. It was a damn miracle at the time. Within two weeks, I was back working part-time, then full-time once Marie was fine as a stay-at-home mom. Looking back, the time just before and just after Michael was a year old. Those had been some of the happiest of our lives, at least for me. To find out it was all due to her trying to make up for blowing a stranger in his car forever altered those happy memories. I asked why she cheated again, if I just wasn't enough for her. I had always thought we had a great sex life aside from her depressed period. She always acted like she enjoyed sex with me. She claimed the longer she went keeping the secret, the worse she felt about herself. 
but unlike before after Michael was born, she couldn't let on to me how she felt. She knew I'd want to know why she was sad to comfort her, but she couldn't tell me. She claimed the internal struggle, keeping the secret and living the lie of a facade of happiness. She reminded me when I went to a reunion of my bio mom's family out of state. I took Michael with to introduce him to her family for the first time. Marie canceled at the last minute, claiming she was ill. I couldn't have stopped her from cheating on me at the moment. That was already done. But I might have kept her from heading down a road that would deceive me for six years that something I cherished was never mine. I wasn't blaming myself. Her ass could and should have been on that plane. No, actually, she should have already confessed to her infidelity and let me move on with my life. Yet somehow, multiple mistakes, complicated with multiple lies, with little concern for consequences, and that's my burden to bear now? That's something you do to an enemy, not someone you claim to have ever loved. She gave me some story about being so depressed that weekend while I was away. She knew she was unworthy even if I didn't. She was punishing herself, even if I didn't know she deserved it. At least that was the way she rationalized it. She knew if I knew I would view her as a whore and be disgusted with her. I never stopped showing my love, telling her how much I loved her. But she said at some point she realized if I knew the truth, I wouldn't love her. The attention I focused on her didn't matter. It didn't carry the same weight as before. Because she realized she was unworthy of the attention. And I'd realize that too if I knew about her sleazy rendezvous. She said she called Becca for a shoulder to cry on, who convinced her to go out for drinks. According to her, she spent the first part of the night crying and asking what she should do. The bartender bought her a few shots to help her cheer up. She didn't have to say Rebecca nudged her towards some flirting. She found herself kissing the guy in the back alley behind the bar and stopped herself. She went back inside feeling even worse than before because she realized she cheated yet again. More alcohol. Becca needed someone to help Marie inside. She asked the guy who had just had his tongue down my wife's throat. Rebecca left him alone and clothes came off. I asked her if she once thought of Michael. If I ever entered her mind as she betrayed us both. She got pissed and told me she never betrayed her son. I let it be known she betrayed not only me and Michael, but Carrie, our parents, everyone who watched us take our vows and God above. She betrayed the sanctity of our family and marriage. But I stopped and just shook my head telling her despite what she'd done to that point, she should have just let me go. I told her I would have looked out for Michael. She could have whored around the whole entire state after we divorced. I told her I would have gladly written her name on bathroom stalls for her, but she didn't. She kept lying. She kept cheating. So much of it disgusted me to hear. Like she had an actual strategy after the first few guys. She didn't want them getting attached to her as she wasn't going anywhere unless she had to. She wasn't looking for an emotional connection. She called it fishing. Getting a guy's number, break the ice, give a little nibble, pull away, get them to pursue, but on her timetable. When she said she already knew, I thought she was beautiful. Getting second opinions didn't feel like a bad thing at the time. I just looked at her shaking my head. At any rate, the bartender is not Carrie's father. That much we are sure of. He was months too early in the game to have been the sperm donor, and she claims they only hooked up that one time. I asked if she could remember the names of the specific guys she was talking to and getting to pursue her. Maybe a couple of first names, but I wouldn't know where to find them was enough to shut that conversation down for the night. Yeah, I wanted more answers, but the details of the BS aren't coming out in one night, and that wasn't what I came there for. She was seated in a chair to be able to prop up her cast on pillows. So, I got down inches from her face, told her she was a pitiful excuse for a human, and I truly believe she has no soul. I told her that her actions have caused unimaginable pain and will continue to do so in the future. But I looked her squarely in the eyes and let her know I was not going to let her hurt my children anymore. I told her point blank that I was the one who got deceit for six years. If anyone was going to be getting a little slack for focusing on his needs, it was going to be me. But Marie, I told her, and I meant every word, petty BS and manipulation is just going to make me loathe her even more. We weren't getting back together, ever. I was disgusted for her to even touch me. Loyalty wasn't even in her vocabulary, but father or not, I was going to be loyal to Carrie. I was going to protect her as much as I could, and if I end up having to protect her from her mother's lies, manipulations, and deceit, so be it. I told her Nadia has friends that would love a new BMW for getting her declared an unfit mother. I went there. It was a threat, and I meant every damn word. I told her if she had things to say, she could say them to my face. Getting Michael or Carrie to relay things their mother said was not happening ever again. 
Gary was to know little to nothing about any details of our divorce and for right now paternity, but when the time came to tell her, I would be the one who would break that news. It would be me who got to explain how her mother victimized us both, but we survived together. There was no way in hell I was allowing the person who destroyed so much for us both to get to downplay it or blame me. That horrible news wasn't coming anytime soon for her as far as I had planned, until the need arises, and I'll decide when that is. I pointed out she doesn't have a lawyer and let her know the kids would be staying with me for at least the next two weeks. She needed some time to reflect on not only the entirety of her betrayal, but her cruel manipulation that will only hurt Carrie. I'd let her know when she'd earned the right to be a mother again. There wasn't much she could do. I had the kids. She's in two casts. Let her live with some loneliness. My God, I've made mistakes in my life. On the drive home, I kept wishing somehow I could have just known how things would turn out. And this is the biggest struggle of my life. I hope it is the biggest struggle I ever face. But so much has been destroyed. The sham marriage I was living needs to be torn down, ground into dust, and the soil tilled with salt. But there is no reason to hurt a little girl who at the moment is blissfully unaware at the battle between her mother and her daddy. I wanted to stay that way. Those children cannot see us together. When Marie and I are in the same room, the entire aura oozes venom. That's beyond toxic for us. I'm not subjecting the kids to any of it. I will not fight her in front of them, but I swear I will put her in her place and call out the slightest BS. I'm sorry this has been very long. I just feel like every decision I make has a thousand ramifications. The man up, DNA doesn't matter people, need to understand that hurting Carrie is the last thing I want to do. And I have every intention of being not only in her corner, but fighting for her. I don't know how this crap is going to end. But me and that little girl got shafted by the same person. A person that I refused to let damage her the way she damaged me. Not happening. And no mother effer is coming around my daughter until I allow it. That won't be Marie's decision. If I check his background and meet him, I'll make that call if the day ever comes. Until that point, my son Michael, my daughter Carrie and I are weathering a storm. I've managed to shield them from what's coming. I will shield them from as much of the shrapnel as I can. But our souls are all going to bleed a time or two before this is all over. This carnage could have been prevented, but once the bomb goes off, it can't be avoided. I'm sorry for venting. I intended it as an update only, but this is all too much sometimes. I am in therapy two times per week. Not sure it's helping, but it's early on with the shrink, so I'll give it a few more sessions. I have to get to bed. So I will post this and let it be. I won't post again for a while. It has helped to verbalize some of what I've been feeling, so thank you. I just need to focus on my healing and make this transition in life as seamless as I can for the kids. Thanks for all the direction and encouraging words. Many have been a huge help. I promise to return the favor and try to help others here someday. Just not today. TLDR, I love my daughter. My heart is still broken, but I do love her. My soon-to-be ex-wife can rationalize anything, but I let her know face-to-face -face she couldn't be manipulating my daughter or the situation. Let's check in with some community comments before we move on to the update. Cranach has a lengthy response. You can't just go on being with your kids without addressing what their mom told them about the reason she is no longer home. Mari has planted a seed in their minds, and if you don't take care of that seed, then it will grow. Find a family counselor, explain your situation to them, explain that it is your goal to protect the kids from the lives of their mother in a child-appropriate way, and that you need help to do so. Regarding Mari, don't ever meet with her alone again. This woman doesn't care about you and is experienced in manipulating a situation to her favor and against you. This is no longer about what she did. From now on, this is a fight for the future, a fight about custody. If you are alone with her, then she can tell everyone else about the things you did, like threatening to kill her, or to beat her up, or, or, or. Maybe you even touched her aggressively and asked her all the time if she likes that, since she is such a whore. I think you get what I mean. Maybe Mari will not even do it, but Rebecca and her will talk, and maybe it will be Rebecca that tells her to spin the story of when you met alone around. Protect yourself and your kids. That starts with not meeting with that woman alone. And if you think now that she wouldn't do that, especially not with the state she is in, then remember the state she was in when she started cheating on you. Keep in mind, you don't know her. You only knew the idea you had of her, but never the actual person. She is capable of doing things that you can't even imagine. Her cheating and her manipulation of the kids is just the beginning, just a little taste of all the things she is capable of. Always remember, lying to you is as normal for her as breathing. Stay away from her. 
Or to say it more directly, this woman, Mari, she doesn't care about you. She doesn't mind to destroy your life if that means that she feels good for a moment. You need to keep that in mind all the time. Or do you really think that someone could do something like she did over such a period of time to someone they love? People do that to people they don't care about, but not to people they love. Mari is interested in one thing only, herself, herself. If she needs to destroy you to get what she wants, then you better believe that she will do so. You think that she is sorry for what she did? That she regrets anything? Look at what she said when you asked her why she told the kid what she said. She blamed you because you didn't give her the chance to keep on cheating on you. The start of her cheating? She blamed you because you were too good to her and she blames the depression. Why is she kept on cheating? Because she knew how you would react if you found out which pushed her to cheat more often because she was so desperate. Everyone is at fault for where she is right now except for herself. She never wanted to make these decisions. She just had no other choice. Stay away from her. Nothing good will ever come out of meeting with her. The OP replies, Cranach, I can't adequately express what your post meant to me, and you are 100% on the money about things to regard Mari. It was late when I posted this last night. I didn't get a lot of sleep, and I am certainly feeling it today. I appreciate every single comment and word of encouragement from everyone, but I don't have the time to respond to each, as much as I'd love to. So I'm only replying to your comment about this post. A few months down the road or longer, when things have settled, I may give an update and answer any question that arise. I was a dang idiot to go over there and confront her. I should have been recording the conversation at the very least. I like to think her parents wouldn't take her side if she accused me of abuse that night or anything, but she is their daughter, yes, as far as we know. They are disgusted by what she has done. They are disappointed she has disrupted their grandchildren's lives. But at the end of the day, they raised her. Their loyalty is to her. I must keep that in the back of my mind at all times from this point forward in everything I do. And thank you for helping me decide it is time to talk with them and explain about the divorce. And I'm going to need help with doing that crap. Within 15 minutes of reading your post, I was on the phone with Nadia to get the numbers of the shrinks she recommended. I didn't even have to call and make an appointment. She got her staff to call and set the appointment up for Thursday after school. It will be tough. They will cry and so will I. Goal one is to let them know Mari and I are done. Goal two is to let them know nothing they did caused any of it. None of it is their fault. Then, my final goal is to let them know this BS isn't my fault either. Right or wrong. I have to promote myself to them and others in the narrative. I cannot let Mari solely determine how this is all perceived by the kids and others. As far as Rebecca goes, well, thank God I haven't laid an eye on her since that horrible morning. I'm sure she's in the background and in contact with Mari. Knowing she probably views her support as having Mari's back and a positive thing anyone would do for the best friend makes my blood boil when I think about it. I'm huge on loyalty, but when you are loyally helping a friend cheat, deceive, and lie without a care for that friend's victims, that's aiding and abetting, not loyalty. Part of me wonders if Becca has any remorse or guilt for her role in this. I shouldn't care, and at the end of the day, I don't. I just can't get past how you help destroy families and sleep at night. I couldn't do it. But then again, I have a conscience and integrity. Everyone is at fault for where she is right now, except for herself. She never wanted to make these decisions. She just had no other choice. I swear in all the years I have known Mari, she had never displayed narcissist tendencies until recently, immediately finger pointing at others, anyone else, to take the focus off of her misdeeds. Yes, she was obviously more manipulative than I ever really knew. Is there such a thing as a temporary narcissist? Can an adult become a narcissist? I'm sure to many I seem naive and gullible, but the person Mari is now is not anyone I ever knew. The easy option is to declare I never knew her. That makes it much simpler. But in hindsight, she changed after Michael was born. I've looked back at her period of postpartum depression knowing that was where our life took the off-ramp toward the hell it has become. I have asked myself over and over how I could have treated her differently during that time to produce a different outcome. Should I have gone a more tough love route? Should I have tried to force her to deal with the reality of life? I had choices and I obviously made the wrong ones dealing with her. But even today, as the dust is continuing to settle, I'm at a loss of how I could have helped her better. I was there for her and Michael any time they needed me. Obviously, I could have done things differently, but I swear I don't know what the better options were. As of today, here are my plans going forward. I need to stick with my therapy and make dang sure I am open and honest with my thoughts and feelings. This isn't a walk it off, rub some dirt on it situation. The next thing I plan is to get the kids in therapy together, by themselves and with me. I'm not here to repair the bond between Mari and her kids. F her. As soon as I grasp one of my jobs in the future is to make sure Carrie doesn't end up being like her. 
It gave me focus. I won't be trying to make her hate her mom, but I'm sure as hell not going to sugarcoat truths that arise as things come out into the open. I will get my name off of Kari's birth certificate, but I decided last night I am seeking primary custody. Mari has a long road for recovery due to her injuries. She'll need tons of physical therapy and possibly more surgeries. While that is going on, she is actually unable to look after them. Her parents were tasked with that responsibility last week. Until the divorce and custody are final, I will have custody and make no apologies for using it. No lawyer she and her parents can afford can match Nadia and company. If I have to destroy Mari to keep from destroying Carrie, I'm fine with that. As stated, my appetite has sucked for obvious reasons. While I'm a rather large guy, I'm not fat. I did go attempt to work out at a gym with a coworker last week. There's just something monotonous about it. But one of the trainers told me about a group he leads every Monday morning once a week. You get your butt out in a field, regardless of weather. You flip tractor tires, you whip ropes, you do sprints, you do crunches, everything but juggling medicine balls. Sounds like hell. Also, sounds like just what I need right now. I can't take the agar out on a dumbbell, but flipping that huge tire like I wanted to flip the bed I caught them in seems logical to fight the rage. I promised the trainer I'd do four weeks straight, each Monday, and proceed from there starting next week. I may break within 15 minutes, or he may need to go buy a new tractor tire because I launched that one toward the sun. Guess we'll find out. But again, thank you so much. I mean, others gave great advice too, and it is nice to know people care about me, but most of all the kids. It makes me feel like I have others in my corner, even if they may be thousands of miles away. I have family and friends for support, but when they have a personal stake in the situation, it's hard for them to be 100% objective. Thanks for taking the time to tell me what I needed to hear and validating what I already knew. The gloves are off, and I've gone into Papa Bear mode. Mama Bear and her friend Goldilocks, yes, Becca is a blonde, may be worthless lying tramps who have effed half the forest. But I will expose to all what wicked witches they both are. And as they failed to learn long ago, don't poke the bear. Your children's reunion with you appears to have been bittersweet. The idea that their biological tie to you has been severed adds another dimension of anguish and bewilderment to the need you had for their presence. It is clear that you genuinely care about your kids and wish to shield them from the consequences of the situation. It's admirable that you're making an effort to protect them from the suffering and keep things normal. Update, 24 days later. Though I'm not sure where to begin, I don't want to leave anything out. I do have a sense of what I hope to convey when I'm done. It's just very hard to discuss any one aspect of my situation that doesn't branch into other parts of my life. If this sounds disjointed, forgive me, but this will be a long read because the life I was living has been gone long enough to the point it feels like that was all a dream and I woke up from. The best analogy I can give is that Mari cast Michael, Carrie, and me in a tawdry reality show against our will and without our knowledge. The show got canceled, the facade was revealed, and we're left with the cold reality of our collective reality. Not a day goes by that I don't think about how happy I was in my old life, but now knowing it was all a complete and utter lie built upon lies, I wouldn't want it back. The biggest news I need to share is that I am no longer legally Carrie's father. I have never been her father biologically. My name is off her birth certificate. Officially, because Mari and I are still married, I'm now Kari's stepdad as odd as that sounds and is to say. When the divorce is finalized as things presently stand, I will officially be nothing to her, nor her to me. What should have taken about two months to do took four months because there was an upcoming divorce to consider. My name had to be removed from her birth certificate to properly forge ahead with the divorce. Legally, I had every right to pursue having my name removed from the birth certificate of a child that is not biologically mine. It was still left up to the ruling of a judge to adjudicate if removing my name was in the best interest of the child. DNA is legally binding to make you pay child support for 18 years, but our court systems find that of secondary importance when it comes to removing names from legal documents. I was willing and able to show the judge I will voluntarily be continuing to pay Carrie's health and supplemental insurances. Many guys in my situation couldn't do that, nor should they have to. None of it should be left up to a judge's ruling. The unjust system didn't affect me. That doesn't mean it is remotely fair. From the moment I first knew Carrie was not my daughter, I have pondered over and over in my mind how to best handle the situation. Yes, learning she isn't mine emotionally destroyed me in ways which I don't think I could verbalize. But addressing Carrie's situation with emotion would have been a recipe for disaster. Our emotions betray us because they are not based on reason and logic. Allowing my love for Carrie guide me would have been just as stupid as allowing my hate for Mari guide me. And legally, I had every right to cut all ties with Mari and Carrie as neither one was ever mine. Morally, I could not let Carrie suffer economically because of her mother's rampant promiscuity. 
Ethically, I could not allow her to feel any of what her mother did was her fault in any way. At the end of the day, and after a lot of soul searching, I came to the realization she and I were both victimized by Mari. My soon-to-be ex-wife removed my agency in regard to every aspect of our relationship when she cheated. I wasn't told she no longer loved me or never actually did. I was not allowed to know she'd been unfaithful. I wasn't informed I was no longer her one and only. I was kept from learning she conceived a baby with a stranger and had me raise that child as my own for six years. Carrie didn't get a say as to whether she would have chosen me as her dad. She never got a voice to tell her mother what she had done to both of us was sheer evil. I wanted to give us both a voice. The day after my name was officially removed from Carrie's birth certificate, I filed a petition to legally adopt her as my daughter. That had been my plan all along. Once I could be certain, just seeing her wouldn't be a reminder of her mother's betrayal. I just had to know that one thing to be sure. And I couldn't know it until I saw her face to face, after learning she's not my biological daughter. If seeing her had felt like a slap in the face her mother gave me when I caught her cheating, I couldn't have done it. People are free to think I'm wrong for feeling that way. Fragile masculinity, I believe, was the term a toxic feminist used toward me when I wasn't sure how I'd react to seeing Carrie again. If I had totally abandoned Mari and Carrie, which I had every legal right to do, I still wouldn't be in the wrong. And I won't pretend that keeping Michael in my life didn't influence my decisions, since Carrie is his sister and Mari is his mom. He's a good big brother and she loves him. The fact mattered in the choices I have made. But Carrie is my daughter. No, it is not the same extent as Michael is my son, because he is blood related. But I'm her dad and I want her to remain in my life. I just felt I needed to legally set the record straight and open avenues to opportunities we never got. On the surface, it seems like pointless legal actions to get right back where I stood. My marriage was a lie. The relationship I had with Mari was a charade. Most likely from day one. What I deserve is a do-over. A chance to pick a different woman to love in the hopes she might be faithful and loyal. But I can never have that. I can never know what might have been, even if anything I could have done would have been better than to marry a disloyal harlot. The kids won't learn the details of their mother's promiscuity and betrayal for many years, but I want them, particularly Carrie, to eventually know my struggle to keep it together and protect them. I want her to understand that as much as I despise her mother, that I gave myself the option to choose or not choose her as my daughter. I chose Carrie. When the judge asked that poor innocent little girl if she wants me to be her daddy again, I want her to say yes without a thought. Only years from now will she grasp that she truly chose me to be her dad. She had options too. We were thrown together and had no say in the matter. But I'm doing everything I legally can to adopt her as my own flesh and blood, even if she's not. One day, when she's an adult and realizes I gave her the chance to be free of me and she didn't take it, I want her to smile. I want her to know I didn't have to be her dad. I chose to be her dad in a way that makes our bond stronger than blood. There are a few people I'm related to I'd rather not be. But I didn't get a say in that matter. Carrie and I chose each other when we both could have bailed. She knows I love her and always will. It's been hard to function just taking one day at a time just to get through the hell that has become my life. It's draining. But I have also pondered on how I want the kids to perceive all of this. Years after the fact, when they are adults, when they learn of their mother's activities, how I caught her and what I uncovered, I want them to be revolted. When Carrie understands I didn't know one penny toward continuing to raise her but did it anyway, I want her to feel grateful. When she understands that her mom put us both in an impossible situation, but we made it through together, I want her to be happy we made it. When we both realize their stability could have been totally destroyed due to their mom, but I held it all together for the three of us. I want them to understand at least part of my sacrifice. There won't be any revisionist lies being told 10 or 20 years from now. I know their mother is a worthless, selfish, wretched excuse for a human being. One day, they will know that truth too, and I hope they both shun her from their lives for what she did, but that will be for them to determine when truth is revealed. All I can do is remove Mari from my life in every way possible and keep living. What happens to her is of no concern to me. The kids are all that matter now. Quite a few people messaged me asking how I handled Mari, telling the kids we could never get back together because I could never love her again. The very next day after school, I took them both out for ice cream at a local park. Michael seemed resigned to the fact I don't love their mom, but didn't like it. Carrie didn't like hearing that I don't love her mom and me telling her that her mom doesn't really love me didn't help. There was a lot of crying and confusion on their part. I was sure to tell them without a doubt that their mom genuinely does love them and I love them more than anything in this world, but they needed to hear the truth and face a reality none of us asked for. I told them I knew they both loved me and loved their mom. That was really all that was important. Carrie asked me why I don't love her mother. I wanted to be as honest as I could to be with her, but I didn't think there was any age appropriate way to tell her that her mother is a batshit crazy whore. Telling her that her mom lied to me and hurt me was all I could come up with. 
She hugged me to try and console me. It nearly broke my heart. Considering she had things to be consoled over she didn't know about yet, Michael asked me what was going to happen concerning the divorce. I told him that they would live with me and I'd look after them in their home during the week. I explained a court would figure out what weekends they would stay at their grandparents' house with their mom. I promised them their mother and I would keep our arguing between us from that point forward. I explained she and I had a long talk the night before after they got home. Carrie said she wanted her mother to stay with us. It hurt me to tell her that was never happening ever again under any circumstances, but she had to be told. She said her mommy had said she wanted to come back and stay with us. I looked her straight in the eye and told her I have no doubt their mom would like to keep staying with us. I told them both that it was impossible for me to explain at that time, but their mother had betrayed all three of us. I said they weren't old enough to understand at that moment, but I promised one day I would tell them exactly why I felt their mom didn't deserve to live with us anymore. Carrie seemed to accept that more than Michael oddly. He began to ask how old he had to be to know what his mom did. He didn't like it when I told him it had nothing to do with age, but instead of maturity level. He said it was a cop-out. I didn't argue with him. I said I wanted them to love their mom and treat her with respect, because as far as they know, she has done nothing wrong to them. They will know someday. I will leave letters to them in my will if I have to, just in case Rebecca is banging some ex-con who is willing to kill me. Barring that, I will tell them myself when they are old enough, knowing it will negatively influence their opinion of her. I have a feeling they will soon see a version of their mother that will do much of that for me. One day they will know what she did to all of us, but we stuck together and made a decent life for her three biggest victims. I'm not capable of faking it in front of them and acting like their mom means anything to me. Their mother is completely repulsive in all ways. If she died, I would not shed one tear for her vile soul as she splits hell wide open. She deserves it. I hate her for what she has done to me and the children. I hate her for what she has allowed herself to become. I hate her for the stress and tears she has brought to our extended families. She deserves no forgiveness, chances, and at least of all, compassion. I don't consider her injuries in the wreck karma, just pain and suffering she deserves. True karma would have figured out a way to not ruin my car and would have done a lot worse than the injury she got. I heard through the kids their mommy was having pins removed from her shoulder the next day. I didn't tell them. I hope they used a strong electromagnet to do it, but it was hard not to. A few weeks after our talk, the kids came home from their grandparents' house with a letter via my son. It was sealed in an envelope with my name on the front. I couldn't throw it away in front of the kids, so I just placed it on the counter with the junk mail. After I got the kids to bed, I passed by the letter and decided to read it. Mari started out apologizing to me for hurting me, claimed she never meant to let things get that far, forgot who she was and wanted to be. She apologized for hurting the kids. As much as I despise her, I had to give her credit. If she'd stopped there, I might have given her a bit of respect. Then she wrote that she still loved me with all her heart, always has, and always will. I needed a laugh. I really did, because I knew she actually believed the BS she wrote. That's what made it so funny. But when I kept reading, she claimed that's why she didn't want to develop feelings for any other guy, because her heart belonged to me. I wanted to laugh. Couldn't. She couldn't give her body to others if she loved me. She couldn't have done something so hurtful if she loved me. She said giving only her body to other men allowed her to know what it was like to be young and free of responsibility and commitments, since she never got to experience that. So, since she never had any emotional bond with any of them, her heart only and always belonged to me. In other words, her affairs were strictly physical. She meant that in a positive way that only the sickest pervert could rationalize. By essentially ghosting Mari, it shielded me from more than her lunacy. I felt I needed to do that for my own sanity. Yet I have also shielded myself from understanding the depths of her depravity in mind and body. I thought thousands of times since D-Day that I never knew her. What she chose to write to me, let me know she never knew me. She wasn't even trying to piss me off. I could tell by the way she wrote it. Her words were essentially telling me her actions were the lesser of two evils. To her, the lack of emotions towards the other men saved her heart for me. That was essentially her rationale. I understand knowing your significant other is having a strictly emotional affair is soul crushing, but no one ever got STDs from an emotional affair. No one ever punched an emotional affair partner through a cell phone or computer. And no one ever conceived a child over phone calls, emails, and texts for another man to raise. I can say with 100% certainty, I would have rather she'd had thousands of emotional affairs and kept anything from ever becoming physical. The fact she doesn't grasp that about me screams, I never knew you. She chose the worst of two evils in my eyes and never knew me well enough to know that. I have read many of the posts written by others here. I have yet to read that anyone's significant other said, things never got emotional. That's essentially what she's claiming. Yet she doesn't grasp that she's admitting to living the last six years of her life 
as little more than an uninvolved, hedonistic, rutting pig. That's how unintelligent animals behave, unable to control their sexual urges and behavior. She understood her acts were wrong and yet felt somewhat validated for what she did and the way she did it. Until that letter, I'd had little insight into how she perceived things she did eagerly with no conscience. The depths of the depravity she not only condoned but welcomed removed every ounce of attraction I have for her. I'll forever have mind movies in my head because of her. They were bad after only catching her with that random guy. They got worse after she admitted to cheating with enough men to fully staff an aircraft carrier. But when the PI showed me the recovered texts, pictures, and videos from her old phone, it broke something in my psyche. It's like I was married to Pornhub for six years. Anyone that finds out their significant other had a one night stand, I sympathize with you so much. People that learn their significant other was having an affair with someone, my heart truly breaks for you. But I can't put into words what it's like to know the love of your life was being defiled like the sleaziest prostitute of ancient Rome and enjoying it. I cannot picture Mari in my mind now without imagining ejaculation all over her face. She disgusts me that much and that is how debased I will view her forever. No amount of emotional bonding with someone else was ever going to make me think that horribly of her, unworthy in an instant that she turned into a six year time bomb. The motion to adopt Carrie was the second or third biggest thing Mary had to worry about the day I filed paperwork. At noon, a sheriff's deputy showed up at her parents' house to serve her with the divorce papers. At 10 minutes past noon, another deputy showed up to serve her with paperwork due to the civil suit I filed against her. The calls and texts from her parents' phones went unanswered and unread. Calls from a lawyer were met with urging to get her own legal counsel to get the ball rolling. That wasn't what she wanted to hear. I'm told she screamed and yelled at several staff members that day. Nadia eventually told her that the divorce would proceed, like it or not. Any further harassment to her or her staff would be severely dealt with. I kind of wish Mari had kept pushing. Orange was never her color, but what she's done should truly be criminal. It was over a week later that a lawyer representing her phoned Nadia and they had their first discussion. He asked if we were serious about the civil suit to try and recover expenses incurred raising a child that isn't mine. Nadia assured him we were going to try and recover every cent incurred due to paternity fraud. She negated to tell him none of it is about money. Even if I win, the odds are high, I will see little or none of what any court awards. But if I win, it will be money coming out of any and every paycheck going to me until paid in full. It would be a costly reminder and punishment for what she's done. And even if I lose, she has to pay a lawyer to represent her, and that's more expenses she can't afford. He said he understood the vast majority of assets, including the family home, were mine long before we married. But he urged that we couldn't honestly expect to get custody of both kids, have her pay a child support, and for her to live with no spousal support after a severe accident. Nadia told him his client had been unfaithful in the marriage long before the wreck and that she picked a bad time to get caught. She informed him our goal was to make it as painful for Murray as possible. Her car was the only item of any value in her name, which was in her possession, and she could keep it. Mari was allowed to keep her retirement savings as her own because my portfolio dwarfed hers. She wouldn't have even had that 401k without my urging she put in the maximum allowed each pay period. She never had to contribute to any utilities. Buying her own car and paying her own insurance was her only expense. The rest of her money was her own. Now she gets to live on it. I know she's already feeling the financial pinch and it's just going to get worse for her. If I win the civil suit, Starbucks sales will plummet, but it has to be done. I just don't think she ever expected I'd go to the lengths I am. As far as cars go, I drove her car around for a few months after my car was wrecked. Being the only thing of value that she owned, adding mileage to the car was satisfying even if it was petty, but I bought a beautiful new SUV and got my buddy to follow me in it as I drove Mari's car to her parents. I left the key in the mailbox with no idea when she'd be able to drive again. Given her past, I was sure she'd be on the hunt for a strange D as soon as she was able. I hoped living with her mom and dad was making her feel young and free of responsibility. However, having random men come sleep over at her parents' house is just tacky. She would eventually need some place classy to offer her genitals to strangers, like a 2020 Acura. I thought about donating her car to the local community college criminal justice department. Those candidates would be experts on the use of luminol by the time they became actual police. As warped as it sounds, the most satisfying thing about dropping that car off was the spare tire. It doesn't have one, never did. That was a major point I gave her when she asked my opinion about purchasing the car. I remember her saying all sweet and cute she had me to call if she ever got a flat. It was all I could do to not leave a note under the trunk mat saying something like, bet you wish you had a spare now, but I'm sure eventually she'll get the message all on her own. A few days after the lawyers spoke on the phone, they met in person to discuss things. Her side wanted a meeting to discuss Carrie's situation. Even if I didn't want to, I didn't want her putting up walls to prevent me from adopting Carrie. I agreed for our daughter's sake, and we met them at Nadia's firm. 
I was seated in the main conference room when Nadia walked in with opposing counsel and Mari. I had never truly understood what people meant when they said someone looked road hard and put away wet until that moment. She looked horrible. For quite a few minutes, I thought my eyes were just deceiving me with some sort of blood rage hatred hallucination toward her. It wasn't until Nadia gave me a side eye glance due to my ex's appearance that I finally knew I wasn't tripping. She'd lost weight to the point that the sides of her face were ever so slightly concave. She'd never been fat and shed the baby weight both times with ease. She looked like she had an appointment to get her mugshot taken in Florida. She'd cut her hair. It wasn't quite a Karen cut, but it was a Karen-esque. And it looked like it hadn't been washed since the wreck. I'm not sure what she could have worn that would have been flattering, but I swear I made sure she got all her clothes back. So nobody could blame me for that ensemble. The two lawyers discussed some things back and forth to start the meeting. I could feel Mari's eyes on me, but I didn't want to look in that direction. I wanted to convey hatred and scorn if I looked at her. When I finally glanced her way, I wondered where the beautiful girl I once knew had gone. Bullet dodged. From beautiful to bag lady in six months. Now I'm just somebody that she used to blow. Thankfully, we began discussing Carrie to take my mind off of how rough she looked. They asked if there had been any attempt to find Carrie's biological father yet. I told them nothing pertaining to that was going to take place until the divorce and custody issues are totally finalized. I then asked if she'd remembered any names that might lead us to baby daddy number two. I felt trashy just saying it, and she didn't like hearing it, but truth is truth. She said no names from that time in her life came to mind. I asked if she had any plans to block me from legally adopting Carrie. She insisted she wished I never had my name removed in the first place. She certainly wasn't going to try and keep me from putting it back. That was all I needed to know. Have a nice day. Drive safely. Nope. Before I could stand up to try and urge the meeting to end, Mari asked me, could you have forgiven me and taken me back as your wife after my first mistake if I confessed to it and swore on my life to never stray again? She got me. It's a question I knew she had asked herself over and over since the first night she strayed. It's a question she knew the answer to, and so did I. And that was the sticking point. Just asking the question was her way of making a statement. She knew giving her body to anyone else in my eyes was an act that would cause me to remove her from my life as instantly and permanently as possible. We had discussed many times how we would both treat being cheated on. I told her if I ever found out she cheated, I wouldn't listen to another word she ever said. The time to talk was before infidelity. Everything after is just noise, excuses, and hot air. After several minutes of silence, I reluctantly told her she already knew I would not have given her a second chance. Then I asked her if I'd had an affair baby with a random hookup and brought it home six years later if she'd look after it. It got ugly from there. She said I was doing everything in my power to hurt her now. I didn't deny it. She said I'm not her parents and that I don't get to punish her for being bad in reference to the civil suit. I made sure she understood the divorce was to punish her. The civil suit was hopefully literal payback I was owed. She said I'd destroy the kids' lives to destroy her. I told her she looked like she'd been smoking meth, but after that accusation, I had proof. She started to cry and tell me she loves me. I just rolled my eyes. Because her tears now garner no sympathy for me and only make me want to treat her even crueler. I promised her the kids would always be well-fed and well-dressed, but made sure she understood I didn't care if she starved or had to wear sackcloth. At one point in my life, I would have done anything and given anything to make her happy. I asked her if my all wasn't good enough for her to be faithful, what more could I have done for her to not betray me? She said she betrayed herself. I yelled that she betrayed Carrie. I told her she betrayed everyone in her life. The lawyers calmed things down and Nadia shared a proposed temporary visitation agreement with them, knowing which weeks she will have them will allow her to schedule a doctor's appointments better. I warned her that while it is none of my business what she does, nor do I care, not to have any strange men around the kids. She said she hadn't been with anyone. She didn't like me pointing out she'd told me that once or twice before, but she promised if that time came, she would shield the kids from all of it. I asked her if anyone other than Rebecca knew she had been unfaithful to me. She said she admitted only the kissing to her sister after the first incident. Her sister freaked out and cursed her the hell out for five straight minutes. Mari knew she could never tell her sister how far she actually went, but no one but Rebecca knew all about the hookups. She asked if there was any chance of us getting counseling to see if things could work out between us. I asked her why would I want a marriage with a dead bedroom. She pointed out we never had a dead bedroom. I explained it was sure as hell dead now because I'd never touch her nasty butt again with a body count higher than COVID. Mari asked if I hate her. I'm not sure if that was a yes or no question, but with every fiber of my being, we'll have to suffice. So there's that. And that's essentially where we are. Just waiting for the divorce case to go before a judge. A civil case can't go on a docket list until the divorce trial ends. 
The kids are doing well, given the circumstances. They get to see both sets of grandparents more. If there is any positive in this mess, there is that. And yes, I know I have to let go of the hate. I'm seeing a therapist, but it took me quite a while to find one I like. Even she acknowledges I have a lot of legitimate reasons to hate Mari. I'm not the kind to seek validation, but knowing my hate isn't irrational helps quite a bit. I know it isn't good for me. My new therapist is helping me vent and try to let go. I'm not very good at meditation, but it's new to me. My first therapist was okay for about four sessions. The first session is always essentially introductions, no matter how much you share on the paperwork. She seemed very positive at first, sympathetic yet encouraging. She assured me I was doing better than most at being a good dad, which was nice to hear. But when we started talking about issues in the past before the cheating started, her tone changed. It's not a direct quote, but she kind of insinuated that sometimes we do things that hurt or irritate our partner, but they say nothing. If those issues fester for weeks, months, or years, it's like a powder keg that we helped create. No, she didn't have a Belgian accent, but I do have enough pride and common sense to know that despite any and all my faults and mistakes, no part of me deserved what Mari did. Nothing I had ever done to her made even 1% of what she did to me righteous actions. So I got a new shrink. I tried a few therapy sessions with a guy. He could understand the feelings of emasculation in mind movies. He could grasp how it's all overwhelming. I just didn't feel comfortable with him. Thank God I'm pretty much all cried out. But if I have to talk about some emotional crap, I don't want to cry in front of a guy. Guys are for drinking, playing sports with, and fighting. We don't discuss why Gary's wife is emotionally unavailable to him and doesn't understand his love language. This guy doesn't anyway. Part of me wanted to give him more of a chance, but I didn't see us developing any rapport. If it makes me sexist, so be it. I just feel more comfortable in confiding in a woman. That's my preference, and I finally got a good shrink. She was the only daughter in her family with three brothers, which takes care of having some understanding of men. Her specialty is coping with infidelity and grief counseling. When I told her about the events that led me there, she used half of a box of tissues. She said she's amazed I'm doing as well as I am. Still not sure if that was meant as encouragement or genuine shock. I'm not institutionalized. I'll call my therapist Sarah for the purposes of this post, but she's helped me quite a bit just by listening. She says I'm difficult to read and that my outward appearance doesn't match my friendly personality. She noted that I use humor to diffuse tense situations and disarm people. I told her it ruins the fun if she calls me out on my BS beforehand, but she is figuring me out. She says I have to figure me out now. She was adamant she was there to help, but rebuilding my life and myself, it's going to take effort by me. I can't just pay someone else to do the work for me. I'm going to have to take stock and see how genuinely damaged I am, repair what I can, amputate what I can't. It's going to hurt, even more than I've already hurt, but I have to come to peace with all I've lost because it's not coming back. The kids see their own shrink, 40 minutes with each and then 40 minutes with the three of us. Twice a week. They've been doing great. The therapy is allowing them to come to terms with the inevitable. I was a little concerned how family therapy was going to go due to how I feel about their mom. I've been silent in sessions when they have expressed missing their mom or wishing we were all still together. I thought about showing them on the doll where Mari hurt me, but dolls don't have a soul. Sometimes I don't feel like I have one anymore either. I have gone out of my way to try to be sociable and lean on friends, but given what I have ahead of me, Small talk feels too trivial. I know friends are tired of me venting. I would be. I've tried to not go to on a rant, but the betrayal still eats at me. It's still always at the back of my mind. Then of course, if we go out for drinks, they are pointing out this girl or that girl. Like I know they are conventionally pretty, but I have no interest in getting to know them. And unlike my wife, the hygiene issues alone would prevent me from doing any hookup activity, even if given the chance. Rest assured, none of these young ladies has left any of the establishments suicidal because they couldn't bed me. The lack of interest was totally mutual. Nobody loses. But this hasn't just affected the way I look at women. It's changed the way I've looked at people. I feel like I'm second-guessing everyone's identity and sincerity. Before all this, Mari was someone I truly admired. It makes me question the other people in my life, both male and female, that I've admired over the years. She hasn't made me a misogynist. She's turned me into a misanthropist. Despite any shame or guilt she feels for what she's done, I know carnal activity again with the next guy will be easy for her. She'll start eating better, gain some weight, and guys will be hitting her up in no time. My point is, she'll move on sexually with ease. I can't do that. I won't do that. I already feel filthy inside and out, knowing all the sperm, ball sweat, spit, and stink from other men she subjected me to. I feel she's defiled me because I've been with her. I feel tainted. She didn't just kill any desire for her, she's killed any desire I have for sex at all. As odd as it sounds, Mari was it for me. She was beautiful, I didn't have a need to look at other women, and I thought what we had was special. Beauty just doesn't even register with me anymore. My mind knows better, but my subconscious thinks all women are like Mari and Rebecca, and that's my struggle, fair or not. 
I had someone send me a very supportive message of encouragement. Then they said they almost envied me as a soon-to-be single guy who is financially secure. He said I'd have no problems meeting women and would be perceived as high value. I thanked him for the support without conveying something that he would look forward to would be a source of anxiety for me. I know people hook up left and right, all day, every day, and everywhere. That is between them and the people they hook up with. Not my thing, but more power to them. I wouldn't want a stranger, even a very attractive stranger, touching me. I'm a personal space kind of person. I cannot fathom meeting a stranger at a bar or on an app and interacting with them very little before getting physical. Knowing humans often then agree to go off somewhere, remove their clothes, and have sex and see no issue with it amazes me. Obviously, in a world with Tinder and dating sites, my stance is the oddity. I'd be contemplating how long it had been since they'd done the very same thing with someone else. The vast majority of people are accepting of the hookup lifestyle. Mari's hookup numbers wouldn't be all that abnormal for the typical single women these days, and I think most guys would behave that way if they could. I couldn't and wouldn't. Plus, obviously never wanted to be with someone who ever has. Part of me feels Mari wasn't forthcoming about her infidelity, just to spite me for what she knew would be my stance. When I said it felt like she was making a statement, that's the statement it felt like she was making. If I wouldn't even consider a second chance, she was going to do exactly what would hurt and disgust me most. The crap test to end all crap tests, then getting revenge on me without me ever knowing I was being tested. Once the bond we had was broken, we could never have that again with each other or anyone else. It was a once in a lifetime opportunity because we are each only granted one life. The continued cheating was what has killed me. If she just admitted to what she'd done and we divorced, I might, I might just have been able to pick up the pieces and eventually give someone else a chance. It's like she wanted to destroy me, so there would be no way in hell I'd ever want to be with anyone again just because she couldn't have me back. Diabolical. And I don't care how many showers were taken and condoms were used, some foreign DNA made its way back to me. Disgusting. I hope her genitals rot out. When Mari and I had only sex with each other, every action was a pure and beautiful act. Her first act of infidelity destroyed all that had been or ever could be, in an instant. Anyone outside a relationship physically engaging with either partner defiles and poisons the relationship forever in a nanosecond. It's like the relationship is a tall glass of cold milk. The second her lips touch the lips of another man, that was like placing one drop of India ink into the milk. It's just one drop. It's still mostly milk. Pay no attention to the rapid discoloration. It probably tastes the same. Just go with it, right? But instead of telling me about the one drop of ink, she let me drink the milk. Not only did she keep letting me drink the inky milk, she kept adding ink. Some people are like a glass of milk with one drop of ink. Mari is now a glass of ink with one drop of milk. She's a defiled slut of no value as anything but a prostitute or a fluffer. The night she was conceived, I wish someone had run up and kicked her dad's testicles so hard they hit his spleen just so he couldn't reproduce again. The world would be a better place. Things most people get a rush from pertaining to new relationships cause me massive anxiety. I remember getting butterflies with Mari. The feeling made me nauseous. I even had to get used to someone as pretty as Mari, whom I liked invading my personal space. It's not a self-esteem thing. She and I were both outgoing around each other, but introverted by nature. Figure out how to really kiss, feeling that closeness for the first time. I had to ease into it. Everyone thinks all teens are hormonal horn dogs, but she and I actually weren't. We very slowly progressed things physically as we learned and grew more comfortable. I was taught that was the way it was supposed to be. That's what I wanted. That's what she swore to me she wanted as well. The thought of trying to be intimate with someone new makes me cringe. But of course, now the thought of Mari is like the antidote to Viagra. It's all too much. I find myself ashamed more every day to be a part of the human species. My life wasn't supposed to go this way. We had so many beautiful moments awaiting us as a family, but memories are destroyed and those moments will never be. At the end of the day, I love Carrie, but I had to let her go because our relationship was forced upon us from day one against our will. By adopting her, I'll tell her if given the chance because I have given myself the chance, I'll choose her as my daughter all over again. When the judge asks her if she wants me to adopt her, it will be her with all that love for me returning. Full circle. Things set right. Or as right as they can be. I can never be her father. That title belongs to some guy walking around not knowing he has a six-year-old daughter. But I'm the only dad she will ever know. Protector and provider, long after any legal obligation would have lasted. I've done what I had to do to keep my sanity even when others questioned my actions or accused me of being cruel. I've done what I thought was needed to allow Mari's two biggest victims to stake their claim to what was never truly theirs. I've made mistakes how I have handled things. I won't know they were mistakes until much further down the road, but I've done my best. I will try to do another update when I can once more issues are finalized. 
I apologize for the lapse between updates and the length. I will try to do better on both as I and the kids press forward together. Peace and thanks to all. Final update, one year later. May 21st, 2023. A few weeks ago, I signed into this throwaway account for the first time in almost a year. There were many messages and comments inquiring about how the kids and I are doing or how things turned out. A very large part of me wanted to ignore them all, sign out, and never log in again because I have managed to get back on course of my life and my children's life, and dwelling on the past only hinders forward progress. But the advice I got from Reddit was supportive and helpful from the start, all the way through several episodes in my life when I was at my lowest points. For those people that assisted me so well and showed me such kindness, I will make this final update, because I do owe a huge thank you to the many who helped me navigate this minefield I didn't yet know I was living in. It's been so long since my last update. Most readers will have completely forgotten my posts, which is totally understandable. Previous links in a TLDR will be posted at the bottom. This will be a long read, and for that I do apologize. But much time has passed, and many events have occurred, to the point where this can't be explained in two or three paragraphs because things have now been finalized beyond what I ever imagined or intended. When I last posted, my soon-to-be ex-wife, Mari, had been kicked out of her parents' house for neglecting to tell them I am not the biological father of our daughter, Carrie. I had informed them I'd caught their daughter cheating the same morning I told them about our wreck. However, she had not revealed to them that the guy I caught her with was just one in a long line of men with whom she cheated. Mari had been forced to live in her car because she had nowhere else to go after being disowned. Meanwhile, I was in the process of attempting to legally adopt Carrie after having the court adjudicate I am not her biological father, and my attorney Nadia was attempting to get Mari to see a mental health professional of her choosing, in the hopes it might benefit me. Nadia recommended two local psychiatric practices to Mari's lawyer, saying we'd pay for her sessions, or she could choose any other therapist she wished to see. I had some major misgivings about having to pay for the sessions or doing anything that might actually benefit Mari. If you learn nothing else from my experience, take this advice to heart. Love them or hate them, always listen to your lawyer. To make a long story short, Mari chose a local psychiatrist who instantly recognized she was mentally unstable. For her own well-being, she committed Mari to the local hospital's psych ward overnight for observation. That overnight stay became many months under psychiatric care in hospitals. Due to the confidentiality rules within the medical field, I never heard her actual diagnosis. But her attorney said each time he saw Mari, she was heavily sedated and out of it. Those initial months, she spent trying on designer straitjackets delayed the finalization of the divorce and child custody hearings. However, since Mari was not contesting and her counsel could stand in as her representation, there was no delay in my attempt to adopt Carrie. As sad as everything had recently been for me in my life, hearing that judge question Carrie and listening to her responses made me so unbelievably happy. Carrie didn't know she had ever been declared not my daughter by the court at my behest. So, it seemed funny to her for the judge to ask if she wanted me to be her daddy. I was so proud of her, though she couldn't understand why. She was just happy when I told her I loved her as she hugged me as her adopted father for the first time. I was glad Michael was also there, but even more grateful, Mari wasn't. Neither Michael nor Carrie really had any understanding of what the hearing was about, but Carrie is now legally my daughter, even if we share no DNA. When I saw Mari cheating, it instantly removed all love I ever had for her. Until I was able to reunite with Carrie, I was so effing afraid that because of what her mother did, I would lose all love for her as well, or resent her. To still feel that love I always had for her again was such a relief. I would not have been in the wrong if I couldn't get past that, no matter what anyone wants to say. If paternity matters enough to the legal system to force a man to pay for a child that is his, it also matters enough for a man to not be able to accept a child that isn't. But dang it, I really needed Carrie in my life. I'd lost too much already, and she needed a dad who had already loved her for her entire lifetime. If I'm honest, there will always be a tiny part of my soul that will remain broken because she is not my biological daughter. I cannot put into words how devastating that was to find out and accept. I know I'm doing the very best I can as a parent in this situation. I believe time given to children and love is far more important than anything any parent could buy them, so will always be my focus. Other than Mari's mental issues, there was truly no reason for the divorce not to be finalized. She wasn't getting a penny from me, and even her own lawyer admitted that in her situation, she had no hope of getting any custody at the time. If and when she got out of her padded cell paradise, if she found a safe place to live, she could petition the court to gain some type of visitation and or custody. The court appointed a legal aid to vouch for Mari being cognizant of what she was doing. Her lawyer got her to sign the divorce papers with witnesses and had them notarized. I had to show up in court with Nadia a week later for attorneys to get the judge to finalize some issues. Two weeks later, I was legally divorced from the biggest mistake and waste of my life. I should have been happy about that, and I was. Signing the papers was the symbolic nail in the coffin to our marriage, yet it all felt anticlimactic somehow. 
It amazed me how well Mari's family stuck to their guns in regarding to disowning her after they found out everything she'd done. I'm sure some of that was due to wanting to stay on my good side so they could visit with the kids. Even though her parents and sister knew she was in a psych ward, they never even attempted to visit. Nor did I, obviously. But I was apparent from the times I talked to her parents how disgusted they were by their daughter's depravity. They were embarrassed for people to know what a tramp their daughter had been. I could empathize and sympathize. Knowing Mari had been run through more times than an oscillating lawn sprinkler in July made me ashamed to admit I had ever been intimate with her. Mandy made sure to let everyone know what her sister and Rebecca had been doing, short of paternity fraud, of course. Between social media and face-to-face -face conversations with friends, word got out about their exploits. Within a month, nearly everybody knew about her years of cheating and sexual immorality, and they all made plans to give her hell if they ever encountered her again. It was slightly humiliating for me having everyone know how foolishly trusting I had been. At the end of the day in a relationship, you either trust or you don't, and she'd never given me a single reason not to trust. It wasn't until a few months before I caught her that I even considered she could ever cheat. In hindsight, a few red flags were missed, but she covered her tracks well. I should have put an end to the girls' nights out, obviously, once her depression subsided, just out of principle. But that night, she stayed out all night was the first and only time that had ever happened before. She'd call if she was going to be 15 minutes late, which was extremely rare. I was actually worried because that was so unlike her, and I wanted to make sure she was safe. I know many people probably think I'm an idiot or blind for not knowing for so long. By keeping things strictly sexual and limiting the number of encounters with each man, she never developed any trails to follow. She wasn't glued to her phone or protective of it. I never felt the desire to snoop. She portrayed herself to be the beautiful, loving wife and mother. I wasn't the only one who was deceived. Many friends have told me face to face they were shocked to know she was cheating and would have told me if they'd known. They had no idea any more than I did. If Mari had worn a dress with no panties on a windy day, and everyone within 40 feet of her could hear the ocean, that would have been obvious to me and everyone else. But everything she represented herself to be, to everyone, was a total lie. They wanted nothing to do with her, and nobody cared if she was kept in the ward the rest of her life. The only problem with no one having any contact with Mari was that it left us blindsided. Nobody alerted us when they decided to let her out. Laws prevented the hospital from letting us know due to doctor-patient confidentiality, I have no idea if she just convinced the doctor she was okay or if they just felt like they had done all they could do to help her, but they released her on a Tuesday just before noon. She somehow made her way from the hospital to her car, which was parked at her lawyer's office behind his home. From there, she took her car and drove to the kids' school. When she was informed that she couldn't see or check the kids out of school, she made enough of a scene that the school called me. I told them to call the police and that I would be there as fast as I could. On the way to my car, I called Mandy to let her know her baby sister was no longer using her Airbnb accommodations on Insanity Island. I told her that I had no idea if she'd been released or escaped, but I'd find out when I got to the school. She said she'd call her parents, my parents, and Doug to let them know what was going on and to keep them posted. By the time I got there, two cop cars and an ambulance were parked out front with lights flashing. I pulled into a parking spot, got out, and headed toward the closest officer. After identifying myself as the ex-husband, he directed me through the side door, which ended up being the school to cafeteria. I was relieved to learn no one had alerted Michael or Carrie to the drama in the front office, and school had not recessed. The police had Mari seated at a cafeteria table, and she tried to stand when she saw me, demanding to see her children. They kept her from approaching me, and I asked if they had checked with the hospital mental health ward to see if they had released her. The police informed me that while the hospital couldn't release certain information without a warrant, they had released her under her own cognition. Mari started crying and demanded to see her children. I told the cop I had full custody and there was no way in hell they were seeing her in such a frantic emotional state. She yelled at me that she wanted to see her children yet again. I told her to go have her lawyer file paperwork for visitation, but unless I saw an evaluation from some mental health professional telling me otherwise, she was an unfit parent and a manic mother. She said the kids are the only two people alive that still have any love left for her. I told her that was probably true, but they're just kids and they don't know any better. The cop laughed then managed to regain his composure. She tried to come at me, he held her back. She said she hadn't seen her children in months and that they were the only thing that got her through her time in lobotomy land. I explained I really didn't give a dang about her struggle to cope with the consequences of her own actions, but there was no way in hell I was subjecting our children to her lies and drama that day. I told the cop I wanted to file a restraining order on her to stay the hell away from me and the kids. He agreed to file the initial paperwork on my behest, but that a judge would have to determine if one was needed and sign it. He then explained to Mari, since I was not going to allow her to see the kids, they had already talked to the principal of the school. 
she needed to leave immediately and not come back onto the premises until she could show a court order granting her partial custody. To my surprise, she didn't make an even bigger scene. I guess she realized nothing she could do at the moment would get her what she wanted. She grabbed her purse and keys before being escorted by an officer to her car. She got in and drove away while the cop and I filled out the restraining order form on his tablet and talked with the principal. Soon enough, the kids got out of school and I loaded up Michael and Carrie to take home. I was about two miles from the school when I thought I saw Mari's car pull out from a fast food restaurant just after we passed by. I took the next right and the next right and the next right until I was on the same street we'd been on. I could see Mari's car up ahead and speed up to try and figure out what she was doing. She was oblivious to the fact I'd managed to maneuver my way behind her. It was obvious she was looking for someone, and that very person was observing her. The kids didn't even recognize her car ahead of them. Thankfully, a Reddit user had urged me to get front and rear cameras with audio recorders installed on my vehicles. That gave me all the evidence I needed to prove Mari was stalking me and the kids even after being warned by the cops to stay away. I went straight to the police station and showed the magistrate footage of Mari waiting for us to pass by, pulling out, and then losing us. She assured me the evidence would be submitted to the case judge, and I should hear I've been granted the restraining order sooner than later. In two days while I was at work, I got a call from the police saying the restraining order had been filed and served that morning. They told me she was to stay 200 yards away from me and the children at all times. She was forbidden from contacting me or the kids in any possible way except via her attorney to my attorney. I was directed to immediately call the police if she did anything to break the restraining order. I felt some relief that at least I had the law on my side, but I fully expected her to ignore the restraining order by trying to contact me or the kids. To my surprise, nobody heard anything from Mari. Her sister said she had not tried to contact her or her parents. I fully expected her to seek out some type of free legal assistance to file for partial custody, but no one ever contacted Nadia. Two months went by, and honestly, the longer we went without hearing from her or about her was a bit unnerving. But about three months ago, when I got home, there was a large manila envelope in the mail. The address was handwritten, and the return address only said Sydney, Australia. The voided stamps were Aussie. I truly couldn't imagine who had sent the envelope or why, but inside was an extremely long letter from Mari explaining where she was and assuring me she wouldn't be coming back. I was stunned when I got the letter, considering the postmark from so far away and who it was from. The things she said in the letter probably left me even more astounded by her evil hedonistic rationale that allowed her to sleep at night. Her maniacal manifesto filled in so many of the gaps about what she'd endured and what led her there. She explained that she essentially had a nervous breakdown during her initial therapy session. Pretty much, the first two months she was hospitalized, she was heavily sedated and on various antidepressant and antipsychotic medications. She said for the longest time when she got there, she just wanted to die. Via therapy and by going to group discussions, she talked through her issues in an attempt to understand why she did what she did. She said the other patients in the group discussions kept looking at her like she was a complete dumb butt for throwing away everything. They'd come from broken homes, abusive relationships, backgrounds with substance abuse and violence. Her life had been as easy as pie compared to their life struggles. When it finally clicked in her warped little mind how badly she'd screwed up and that none of her old life was coming back, she had another breakdown. Her first breakdown was due to facing her past, the second due to her facing her future, or lack thereof. She went on to explain her feelings of loss and heartache in some half-cocked attempt for sympathy. Mari had the audacity to claim that the morning I caught her cheating, what upset her was knowing I instantly didn't love her anymore and never would again. She claimed over the years whenever she felt guilt for what she was doing, she rationalized it by telling herself I wouldn't love her if I knew what she was doing and she wanted me to always love her. She was right. It instantly killed all love I ever had for her the moment I saw her naked with another man. She said to know I truly no longer loved her broke her heart because despite all that she did, she still loved me. She swore just because she'd had sex with all those men didn't mean she ever loved me any less. I'd hate to know how she would have treated me if she'd hated my guts. She had the audacity to call me her best friend and soulmate. She had no desire to have any romantic connection with anyone but me. She said having men openly tell her they wanted to do nothing more than screw her brains out and giving herself over to her primal instincts without a care in the world about consequences was such a rush. She confessed that after cheating a few times, Becca convinced her humans were never meant to be monogamous. She said she would have been more than willing to allow me to have sex with other women, but she knew I'd never want that. She said being able to hook up with some guy she met at the store and be home to make dinner made being just a mom and wife feel less hopeless and mundane. She tried to quantify that I somehow benefited from her having other sexual partners because it taught her to be a better lover when she was with me. I would have far preferred a completely dead bedroom than being married to a wannabe sorority slut with a tram stamp of the word next and an arrow pointing down. 
And what kind of guy would stick his dick inside another woman that gave it up so easily? Those guys are just worthless whores too. Next time go break one off instead of helping to break up a family. Call me old fashioned, and I'm sure a lot of people that have read my story have called me that and far worse. But if you feel you need to explore your sexuality and be wild, that is your decision. You are completely entitled to it. It seems today very few don't live their lives that way. But the time to explore and hook up is long before you have children. The time to do that is way before you marry. And it sure as hell long before you reach the effing point of cheating on your husband with so many men, you give birth to some stranger's child and tell your husband he's the father. However, if by going out, being wild and exploring your sexuality turns you into someone or something only the most hard up desperate man would ever consider making a commitment to, so be it. If at any point while we were dating Mari had told me she needed to break up so she could go get pipe laid by random plumbers she just met, I would have been totally fine with it. That would have told me she lacked the morality, loyalty, and trustworthiness I wanted in a wife. If she revealed who and what she was when we were dating, it all could have been avoided. I would not have cared one iota who or how many men she had sex with, as long as I wasn't one of them. She was either always unworthy of my time and love or became unworthy via her unforgivable, filthy actions. But just as she can't unscrew all those men, I can't go back in time and keep her out of my life. Words be danged. Her actions have proved she is unworthy of anyone's time and certainly not love. She will end up a last call lay at some dive bar down under, allowing anyone drunk enough to still find her attractive to get their rocks off for 15 minutes of companionship. She wrote how much it broke her heart to get the petition notice that I was having my name removed from Carrie's birth certificate. Mari said she understood I couldn't even stand to look at her anymore after what she'd done, and our daughter was just a reminder of that. She claimed what hurt her even more was when she got my petition to adopt Carrie as my daughter. Because it showed her even though I could never give her a second chance, I had enough love in my heart to give a second chance to the very product of her infidelity. She said she struggled with feelings of being jealous of her Carrie. Knowing her kids would grow up receiving all the amenities she took for granted killed her. Frankly, her words spoke volumes about how truly self-centered she really is. She couldn't think of me and put me first. She couldn't even do that with her own children. Yet she hated knowing huge moments of her kids' lives would happen without her around to see them. She imagined pictures shared on social media reminding her of what she was missing and feeling like she'd been stabbed through the heart. She explained that when she was released after the events at the school that day, she went around that night trying to reconnect with old friends. The few people that would speak to her were very direct in what they thought of her, in that they wanted nothing to do with her. Most acted as if they didn't know her and just ignored her. A few warned her if they ever found out she'd been with their husband or boyfriend, God help her. But she realized her hometown had been poisoned against her. Her former boss and many co-workers knew, so there was no going back to her job. The other driver's auto insurance had given her a decent check each month to live on until she was locked away. She had to stop going to physical therapy and the insurance company considered the matter of the accident and her injuries a closed case. She had no money. Getting a job close enough to potentially see the kids wasn't happening quickly and she had to survive on her own. She pawned a few items to get by while she looked for jobs online and that's when she said she met some guy from Australia online. It seems they chatted back and forth over the course of a few days and he invited her for a visit. She'd already been seriously thinking of cashing in her 401k but was scared about paying the huge tax penalty at the end of the year. The invite to Australia was all it took for her to cash in the only chips she had. She said he's a really nice guy and has a son that needs a mom. Poor kid is getting Joan Crawford for a mom and he's getting Amber Heard for his wife. It's safe to say he has no idea what she's done and what she's capable of. She's his problem now. She'll become an Australian citizen, won't have to pay the IRS, and she will never be my problem again. It was the last contact she made and will hopefully be the final contact she ever makes with me again, fingers crossed. Part of me thinks she heard Australia was founded as a penal colony and thought they said penile. But if it keeps that crazy hooker down under and out of my hair, she can do whatever she wants. I hate to be so flippant because I do sympathize with the citizens of Australia as yet another venomous species becomes endemic to their ecosystem. But these are the ignominies you have to face as a people for mocking planetary gravity generation after generation. Yes, I'm giddy that she's gone and I have every right to be. But Australia, sincerely, thoughts and prayers. You all may want to get some of those guns back. Between providing antipsychotic medication and treating STDs, she may bankrupt your entire socialized medical system. Obviously, I hope she stays away, but a potential arrest upon her return for tax evasion with the punishment being time served in federal prison will hopefully seal the deal. My therapist has helped me quite a bit, especially dealing with anger, though I'm sure no one reading this could tell. 
My therapist and I came to an epiphany during one heated session. For the longest time, I was far angrier at myself than I was angry at Mari. People talk about forgiveness and how it sets a person free. I had so much anger built up inside, I just assumed 100% of it was directed toward Mari. Nope. It turns out despite her flaws and missteps, I held myself to a higher ethical standard. I was beating myself up with self-loathing because I couldn't believe I'd chosen so poorly. Yes, Mari was the deceitful lying whore, but at the end of the day, I chose the whore and screwed my own life up. I can say without a doubt, I would be much better off having never loved Mari and that Lord Alfred Tennyson was an effing idiot. Lots of people asked about Rebecca. I found out that after Mari was kicked out of her parents' house, she did in fact go to Rebecca's. Apparently, my ex thought Becca owed her a place to stay at the very least after contributing to our marriage failing. Rebecca seemed to feel like all she had done was to enable Mari to do what she actually wanted to do and didn't owe her a dang thing. It's an interesting debate topic, one which apparently got heated. I have no idea who won, but that friendship ended with a lot of hair pulling, profanity, and punching. Either way, word got out Rebecca had been involved in destroying my marriage and things got rough for her. I don't use any social media, no, I don't consider Reddit social media but I'm told she was unfollowed, unfriended, and harassed online. In real life, two stylists quit her salon due to what she'd done. The ones that remained all had customers asking how they could still work there or if they'd changed salons too. It took a month or two until she couldn't pay the lease and had to close up shop. The last anyone heard, Rebecca was working at her brother's restaurant in Connecticut as a hostess. When she left town, I wanted to have her condo bulldozed like Forrest Gump did to Jenny's childhood home due to all the heinous sex acts that occurred there but the neighbors in the other two units weren't too keen on that idea. Quite a few people insinuated in comments that there was chemistry or something going on with my lawyer Nadia and me. I thought they'd been doing meth. Turns out, I am as oblivious as always when a woman is interested. After the divorce had been finalized, since she wasn't representing me in the civil suit that never happened, I went for drinks with her and several others in the practice to celebrate. As others left one by one, she said she had to talk to me about one more matter before I left. I assumed she was going to ask for a good review on the practice's website or something. She surprised me by telling me after working on my case she truly appreciated how loyal and dedicated I had been to my wife, and still am to my kids. She admitted over the course of the divorce she'd grown attracted to me but couldn't say anything as she had been my lawyer. She confessed I was very hard to read, and she couldn't tell if I had any attraction toward her at all. But she knew a good man when she saw one, and she was going to shoot her shot. It was flattering to hear, especially after you've learned you weren't enough for your wife not to cheat with enough men to field five football teams, and Nadia even told me long before I gave her a well-deserved huge bonus check. So as distrusting as I am, I think she was being sincere in what she said. She just told me if I ever wanted to go out and have a drink or talk, to give her a call. Nadia is a beautiful woman. I don't think any guys could refute that except for the visually impaired ones. She's brilliant, genuinely talented, she has her crap together. It's pretty obvious she goes to a gym quite frequently. Lawyers like to look good in the courtroom, and she dresses classy sexy, which the gentleman in me appreciates. At one hearing when she came into court in a pinstripe suit, I'm fairly certain the judge would have granted me custody of his kids after he saw her. Even as jaded as I am, I have to admit, she would be a fantastic catch for any guy she chose to date. But for me, that, or any other juice, is just not worth the squeeze. I already know I would subconsciously judge her for her past, which she certainly does not deserve and could do nothing about. And unfortunately, any women I felt an inkling of interest in would be subject to that same unfair judgment. I had plenty of dudes message and urge me to go on a dating app and hook up with some random, just to get past the fact Mari is still the only woman I've been with. Sorry to the guys that will be disappointed to hear, but I could never do that. A friend showed me the local Tinder prospects. I will not be downloading the app. If I had any desire to get banging my second bedpost notch out of the way, as one message suggested, I would have gone the Nadia route. It pisses me off knowing that Mari took something I used to really enjoy and removed that activity from my life forever. Now just thinking back to our past moments of intimacy makes my skin crawl knowing she was doing those very same things and far more debased with many other men. In my eyes of most people in Western society today, the fact that I've only been with one woman would either make me a prude or hard up. Yet I feel as filthy as a Victorian era London streetwalker just due to knowledge I've had sex with Mari. She took everything that made sex special to me and made it impossible for me to experience again. Our exclusivity, our vows, and union were pissed away so she could experience sucking a random cock that didn't belong to her husband. And then she lied. Oh my god, did she lie. Because she lied for the longest time, I think back to any positive things she ever said about me and believe it to be a lie too, just because she said it. She made me doubt my sanity, my parenting, my strength, and my worth. I don't want to ever go back to that. I won't go back to that. I have no one, and yet I'm still living. That proves there isn't a woman out there I can't live without. I'm already doing it. 
I have no hate for women at all and want the best for them because Carrie too will be a woman someday. But there is absolutely nothing any woman on this planet has that would enrich my life in the least, only complicated. If there aren't some women who feel that way about men, there should be. Human beings, both male and female, are a scourge upon each other, not worth the time and energy, and not to be trusted. Many people ask questions pertaining to finding Carrie's biological father. I have done quite a bit of research into DNA ancestry sites. My biggest issue is that if there is an existing match, the companies also alert the other person. If Carrie took a test which revealed a cousin, an uncle, or even her dad, I am her protector. I don't want anyone to come looking. She's a healthy child with no apparent genetic defects, so I'm going to wait quite a while to do any testing. My mindset as of this day is to wait at the very least until her mid to late teens, but I could envision waiting until her 20s to let her make that decision. Honestly, I've also considered never telling her I'm not her father. Truly, if there is any evidence I could still use from Reddit, it would be questioning at the end of the day that would truly be best for Carrie. Do you think never telling her now after all that has happened would be a good or bad thing? Should I wait until she is a teen or an adult at 18 to tell her and begin the search? I'm not worried about me. I already know the truth. I'm trying to prepare for any future scenarios, both good and bad. How likely is it she will have some medical condition she will need to know her paternal medical history? Please know any DNA genealogy testing will likely happen several years down the road at the earliest. With her mom out of her life so recently, I don't want to do something that could make her feel less secure, safe, and confident in her own identity, and mine. It's odd to be in the situation I am, and to sincerely hope both kids took after their fathers. In closing, I want to thank Reddit user Cranock in particular for the advice given to me through my ordeal. You probably aren't 187 years old, but even if you are, you are wise far beyond your years. You were able to analyze my ex and predict angles I was leaving open for her to attack. And when you said she was desperate, I believed you. But dang. In the end, Mari literally screwed around and found out. Thank you for assisting me in every way to help her find out. To the many others who pointed me in the right direction or sent me an encouraging message, I thank each of you. My plan is to post this, wait half a day, and maybe respond to a few comments over a period of a few days. Then my story will officially be done. I rarely even think about Mari anymore because I stay so busy in my new life without her. So, I don't want to dwell on what has happened for more than a couple of days. My kids are my world and I actually love my job, which keeps me busy. The pay is just a bonus for being allowed to do something I enjoy. To any Australians who read this, I hope I don't offend in any manner. That was not my intent in the least. I hate being the bearer of bad news for your nation as a whole. You guys didn't deserve this any more than I did. Just remember, if she gets drunk wearing a skirt with no underwear and does a split in one of your bars one night, gently rock her back and forth to break the suction and she'll pop right up. To all those who took the same time to read, I thank you and wish you a good day or night. To those who didn't, congratulations, OP, on your courage, tenacity, and resolve during this trying road. You showed incredible bravery by tackling the challenges head on and taking action to safeguard your family. Even if it's challenging, you have shown your family that you are committed to them and have an undying affection for them. You should be proud of yourself for giving your kids a secure atmosphere and putting their welfare first. Despite the difficulties, it is remarkable that you remain committed to being the best parent you can be. Throughout this healing process, keep in mind to be gentle with yourself. You have already accomplished so much, so it is acceptable to feel conflicted and to have occasional setbacks. Keep yourself surrounded by supportive people and keep asking for help when you need it. Maintain your resolve, your faith, and your onward motion. You've shown that you can overcome challenges and build a brighter future for your family. I think better times are coming for you, and you deserve to be happy and fulfilled. Cranock has another response as well. I'm truly happy how everything has turned out for you. You're a good guy and on a good path as well. Since I bombarded you with advices all the time, I will also give you two more advices now. First, Carrie. You know firsthand what lies can cause. Don't lie to her. Also, not by omission. Talk to a family therapist, tell them about the situation and that you want Carrie to know the truth. This truth includes that you love her, which should be the most important point when you bring anything up. Then make a plan with the therapist and also make Michael a part of the process. They both need to become an unbreakable unit. But from all you wrote, I have no worries about that. But take some time with that. She has went through enough in the last year. Allow things to calm down a bit first. Second, you. Stay true to yourself. That is the only thing I can tell you. You got your heart at the right spot and values that others can look up to. No matter what happens, be strong in your beliefs and always stay true to yourself. I wish you all the best on your way forward, my friend. Scary Inspector 8315 also has something they want to say. So, nothing with Nadia? 
That is the only sad thing about this update. And definitely tell Carrie. She deserves to know, and it's better be from your mouth than anyone else. Make sure to tell your children the whole truth when they grow a bit older. They will need to know. Good luck moving forward. I hope you recover your mental health enough that you can date again. You deserve love and the pleasure it brings, and the kids would love to have a good and exemplary mother figure in their lives. Who knows, maybe Nadia waits a bit, or some other good woman. The OP replies, Wow. So I take it most everyone thinks I should at least make an attempt to develop a friendship with Nadia and see where it leads. Just from the responses to your comment, I don't think I need to take an official poll or anything. Here's my thing. That newness of someone else that so many people yearn for would cause me nothing but a panic attack. Butterflies, tingles, whatever you want to call them. That is not a pleasant feeling for me. In fact, it makes me want to vomit. It affects my nerves so badly. Like I don't know how to flirt. I don't know when I'm being flirted with. And if I did, I wouldn't know how to flirt back. I'm obviously rather blunt. Hints, innuendo, body language. I can't read any of that. I mean, like, even watching a movie, when flirting occurs, it doesn't register in my mind as flirting. To me, it just seems like two characters are just being friendly. I'm usually even a tad shocked the two characters end up in bed or a relationship because I don't see it coming. I'm friendly with most people, most of the time, but I'm certainly not flirting. Let's just be blunt. I have no game, because I never had to develop any of that. I'm honest to a fault, and I've learned that doesn't go over well with a lot of people. The mind games, crap tests, attempted manipulation, I don't want to deal with any of that crap. And while I don't know for certain, women like Nadia constantly have dozens or more men trying to get with them. Single women interact with several suitors at once, most of the time, who compete, unknowingly for their time, attention, or whatever. I don't compete. My philosophy is if she thinks she can do better, take your butt on, second chances aren't a thing with me. Conversely, I know thinking anyone is going to push all the others aside and see if there is something between us without outside influences isn't going to happen. Not in this world, not at this point in history. I do not want to be a part of the dating scene. If it makes me an a-hole, so be it. But if any of those people was worth knowing or being in a relationship with, they wouldn't be single or on a dating app. Those are the rejects nobody would commit to, or the male and female sluts that could never commit to anyone because of their free-range genitals that need to roam. I would absolutely love to have Nadia as a friends without benefits, but it's fairly safe to say a beautiful adult woman is going to want some benefits eventually. No woman in her early 30s is looking for companionship, and that's all I could handle right now. She has a bad freaking Jaguar F-type I would love to drive, but most women are looking for a guy who wants to get inside their pants, not their car. But at the end of the day, it is something I need to consider. I will ponder things over. I meet with my therapist Tuesday and will discuss things with her. I make no promise, except for the promise I will take the consensus advice into consideration.